Okay, so um, I'd like to um, first introduce uh, Dan, and he's going to be talking about all the microscopes that he has um, at EBIC. Um, so I'll pass the floor to you, Dan. I'm Dan Clare. I'm one of the principal EM scientists at EBIC. So we run or kind of co-run that with Alistair and Paige Young. It's the UK National Cryo EM facility, and it's based at um, Diamond Light Source. So EBIC is kind of a, a facility based on as a synchrotron model. So obviously we're based at Diamond. So we have different types of access. So the rapid access is you can apply for a session. You get 48, 72 hours at the moment. Mo due to the current situation, we tend to be running 72 hour sessions. Um, the main mode of access is now for us is the block allocation group, so bag access, and this is kind of multi PIs from either one institute or multiple institutes that kind of form a collective, put an application form in, and we allocate pretty much 8% of the time on our microscopes, so um, via this method. The acceptance criteria is uh, scientific excellence and the uh, work should be published so there's no so the microscopes are free at the point of access there's also obviously the INX discovery route for uh, EU users and currently EBIC has a, about a thousand users and there's some publication stats for this year um, we also have a collaboration with Thermo so we have um, a specific a unit for um, looking after industrial or um, what's that proprietary access. So for that, we have a, a, a dedicated cryos and glacius microscope, and that's run by Jason from Diamond and Rishi from Thermo. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention based on some of the things I've seen is that, you know, so part of EBIC's remit is training. So we have uh, run uh, cryo EM sample prep courses. I think we've done three of them now. We've also done a micro ED course, and we're you know we were planning a cryo ET course, which has kind of been put on hold a little bit due to the current situation. And for anybody who was in the training thing this morning, we're also part of the uh, grant that's headed by Becky and the Leeds um, guys on. Uh, training so that's including Leicester, Glasgow and Birkbeck. So one of the things that we've done which has proved to be useful in the current situation is this kind of you know EPU user training so people who are just essentially trained to collect data via EPU. We also have other train you know we we're also running other training so super user training which allows people more control of the microscope and potentially some serial EM training and things like that. Um, so again, this is diamond. So this is the main synchrotron ring. Um, we still have our original microscope cross one sitting on the hall floor. It's still, well, it's not actually currently working because the autoload is bust, but I'm, I'm assured that that will be uh, sorted out tomorrow. Uh, and then we have our main building where our four um, other crosses are based and a uh, the two Glacius and Talos that we have, and we also have a couple of uh, cryofib sems. So, and uh, more recently, we've just um, got this cryo, uh, like a cryo clem machine as well. So this is just uh, an image from the cryos hall. So we have kind of four crosses fairly closely packed together, similar to the um, factory uh in eindhoven i think that's where alistair got the original idea for this um we also have some kind of nice bits and pieces like the ln2 direct auto fill system so we have pipe work from a, an external dewer that feeds all of the ln2 to the microscope so we don't have to worry about uh swapping 200 liter dewers over um, we've also now put one of our glacius and our talus on the same system so that's pretty nice um, we're in the process of hooking up gas so we have a second ln2 cylinder that we can run at a higher pressure mainly for our um, cryofibs um, which we're also going to pipe into the crisis so they'll be completely off uh, any kind of 
viewers in the room, which from a safety perspective is pretty nice. Um, okay, uh, then we have, oh. ah, okay, I'm gonna do that. Then we have a central control room where we have the controls for um, all five cryos um, and the Talos and a glacius at the moment. The second glacius will go in there eventually. Um, so that's the kind of setup that we have. So those are the instruments. And as I say, most of our users are external users. So we have to have quite a substantial kind of user administration system to make this work. So for Diamond, that's the UAS. So that has all of the user information. Um, it allows us to schedule visits based on the Synchrotron operation calendar. Um, during that process, users can submit, you know, preferred dates and things like this. It allows us to, when your visit is scheduled, we'll schedule a local contact, so one of us. So that will be your main point of call for your microscope session. Then we have obviously a dedicated user, um, a user office, which deal with kind of user requests. So anything non-microscope related and um, accommodation and access, obviously we don't have any users come into site at the moment, but that may start. And this also kicks off things like, you know, it uh, generates the visit folders in the diamond uh, system and is also linked to the data archiving. We also, as part of this, once your visit is kind of scheduled, we have the UAS, um, we'll then uh, send you an email. You can then fill in the details for your visit. Um, you know, detect a choice. You can also put all your samples onto here, which means that they can be checked by safety and all of this can be sorted out, uh, hopefully well in advance of your session so that doesn't hold anything up. The other thing that this also kicks off is um, you have a, in a kind of experimental information system, which is ice by B, which is Kind of a collaboration with uh, ESRF and Diamond. Um, you will have um, a visit which you can then start to set up things like shipments. So uh, shipments between your institute and Diamond can be done through Ice by B. You can get the labels done, things like that. Um, this is where we're going to hopefully put the kind of pipeline information and things like that. So um, and. So the MX guys have quite a lot of information on sample details and positions and things like that, which we're also eventually get around to putting in. So due to the current situation, most of the access that we've been offering has been remote. So again, because we have all the users registered, we can essentially, uh, for each microscope session, the users will be able to access the, the microscope that they're using via no machine only during that kind of time period. I think it's an hour or two either side of the uh, sh scheduled time that they have. Um, <clears throat> so they go in via no machine using their diamond credentials, then they can select their machine of choice. Uh, the local contact will have loaded the system and just for just to make it as kind of straightforward as possible, we tend to also do tune the, the filter and take the gain reference. And then we'll kind of hand the microscope over to the, to the user. And then, um, so they'll go in through no machine then use team viewer to gain access to the microscope PC. And then they can do the screening, set up the EPU sessions. And then once they're ready to go, they contact the local contact who will then set up the data transfer and the process and pipeline. So currently um, we're with obviously Shores group at the LMB and Colin has put a lot of effort into this as well as um, guys from EBIC um, and Diamond. So Marcus, Anna and Yuri and Yuri's uh, former student Donovan. So we're running a rely on IT pipeline. So essentially your LC will your local contact will transfer the data. You will set up, we have these kind of set up uh, page where you put in some details and then this will kick off uh, a Reliant 3.1 pipeline. So 
Um, at the moment, this is all being handled by the LC. The idea is, is that this will be part of I Spy B. So we're working on getting that done, hopefully by the next run. Um, so the pipeline run, yeah, routinely goes to 2D. We could set it to 3D, but obviously uh, that requires a bit more CPU, GPU power, which we will have probably come the next run because we've just made another substantial purchase to the cluster. Um, we're running Cryolo for the picking um, and we're looking at integrating various other bits and pieces. <coughs> so um, the detectors of choice. So most of the time people are using the uh, energy filter. So quantum K3 combination. So there's all the kind of uh, Gatan blah, blah. It's bigger, it's faster. We all know that. Um, it Because it's faster, you can use higher counting rates, kind of routine uh, exposure times in non-CDS mode are kind of one and three seconds. Um, we initially started off with Serial EM because um, it wasn't integrated into EPU. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've got the LZW compressed TIFF format. So it kind of makes um, it makes it a slightly more friendly to write super resolution format, which I'll show you might be vaguely useful still. Um, and we tend to get for a 40, 50 frame movie between four or 500 uh, megabytes. Um, the one thing that we've done is we've got kind of a bespoke uh, solution for moving the um, K3 servers out of the microscope room. So we have, I think this was, uh, well, this was mine, Harrow and Jason uh, worked all of this out. Um, so we've got fiber and we've got essentially a connection from the camera head to our comms room and that seems to work very well. Um, just going on some speed tests. So this is something I did with Serial DM a while back. So this was just essentially seeing how fast I could get it to go. Um, <coughs> pardon me, obviously this is with image shift data collection. So uh, the fastest I got with, so this was 189 movies per on a single stage tilt. Um, so it was 3000 movies kind of if you work that out, it's about 740-ish an hour. I have processed the data. It did go out to a reasonable resolution, but there are some issues with it. And then for just for just for fun, we I looked at kind of a fringe-free simulation because we are getting that installed. Um, and so that would essentially same parameters here, just double the number of shots and that got me to about 840. I mean, I obviously didn't process the data because yeah, it's not processable. So we had quite a lot of conversation in one of the earlier meetings about benchmarking and things like that. And I know this is, you know, people have probably turned their screens off because they've seen apoferritin yet again, but it is an extremely useful object for benchmarking things and just checking detectors. So this was kind of the last session we had before the lockdown. So I just done the calibrations of Serial EM on Cross 2 with the new K3 installation. So apoferritin. Um, and so I've collected this in CDS because I wanted to do some other tests. So compare kind of single particle and uh, tomography. And for us anyway, to, uh, we have to use CDS for tomography. Um, just game referencing is not good enough outside of that. Um, so this was a data set collected at 64K, which is uh, on our system 1.34 angstrom per pixel. Um, by default, we collected super resolution. So you can process this at, at the counted resolution. It goes to Nyquist without any without any real effort, you can then go to super resolution, process it, and you can get to 1.9. So that's, I think, 1.4, which kind of fits in with a recent paper um, from the From group showing that super res that they, I think they got a 1.4, I believe is a factor that they saw as well. So it's just to say that kind of uh, 
the super resolution still works and it might be worth considering and one of the benefits of collecting the data in super resolution is you can always if you hit Nyquist go and this was a very nice grid from UN and uh, Vinod um, and it compares quite well to so essentially this is double the mag without super resolution it's a bit better um, but yeah all in all the structure is not so bad um, the real reason I kind of uh, used CDS was because I wanted to give myself something to do over the lockdown. And so I wanted to have a look at some kind of sub volume averaging because I've not done that for a while. So I collected 50 tilt series uh, We're using the, exactly the same grid. So it's the same grid that the date was collected at the same mag with the same conditions. Um, so listed there, kind of 10 frames per tilt, two and a half electrons. So about a total dose of 100 electrons with three degrees plus minus 60 degrees. So, you know, it is an ideal sample, I know that, but again, it's more, this was kind of a training for me and it might be useful for calibrations in the future. So tilt series look pretty nice. Don't see any strange uh, gain referencing issues. The tomograms process pretty straightforwardly in IMARD, so I'd patch track these. There are no fiducials. Uh, initially, I went to use PEAT, but then after some uh, initial tests, I switched to using EM Clarity. So one of the nice things about that is you have the template-based uh, um, picking. So you can see essentially the cross-correlation peaks and then the selected particles, and you can see they're all in a nice line. It allows you to remove some. And so then I went about trying to teach myself how to use EM Clarity. And in the end of it from, I think this is from 27,000 volumes. Um, I should say that uh, initially I got to about four, but then um, Peijun had a chat with Ben and uh, persuaded him to include some more symmetry. So octahedral symmetry is now available with the latest version. I should say thanks to Thomas as well, who helped out with some of the things and Zeng Yi who's now in, uh, in Heidelberg. And so, yeah, I got to uh, an estimated resolution of about 2.9. If you compare it to the single particle map, it's not so bad. If we take a zoom in on one helix, for example, they look pretty comparable. So the SPA maps at Nyquist, which was 2.68, and this is at 2.9. I do have some more data to add, so we'll see uh, how close to Nyquist I can push it. Um, <clears throat> so then some of the other things that's, uh, that are going on at EBIC. So we do have a cryofib milling user program. So we have um, different accesses for that. So we have a rapid access if you've uh, got your own kind of cryos or high-end machine that you're going to do the tomography on. So this would allow you to get access to either the SIOS or probably more likely the Aquilos. Um, we also currently have standard access route, which um, I think we've got somebody uh, next week for one of these, which is three days of fib milling and then two days of, and if you need kind of any information on this, James is the kind of man at EBIC to contact on this. And um, yeah, so what I wanted to add to this is, this was brought up yesterday. So we're in the process of getting the Aquilos 2 upgrade. So hopefully that will increase how much of the milling process can be automated, increasing throughput. Um, they include some modifications that make the dual hold time last longer. Um, we've also had the uh, easy lift, so Thermos cryo lift out uh, prototype installed on the system. And these are some of the results that James has got. Um, so it works, it seems to be pretty good. Um, we just have, well, there, there's an issue with contamination, but yeah, that's that seems to be fib milling in general. So um, then we are just about to start our commissioning uh, program for MicroED. So this was some work done quite a while ago. It's published now from Emma on Protonase K. Um, so Yun's kind of leading on that and uh, yeah, post the commissioning program we'll see and um, so there will be a general user program coming on that soon we also have a chameleon at diamond which 
um, people, uh, if they email me, can access. We are going to put this on a on a user program, and this is a, obviously a collaboration with the RFI. So Jim, Miriam is the person who does the work, and uh, obviously Michelle from STP. Um, so yeah, um, so we've had a number of users come and try the system. We're just about to get the new system, uh, the updated system at Diamond. So that should happen in the next month or so. Um, the other new bit of kit that we have is the like cryoclem. So um, this is for obviously doing correlative um, kind of light and electron. Um, so yeah, this has only been installed and we had a bit of a fight to get it into one of the rooms and things like that. So it's a bit behind where we'd like it to be, but um, Ulica's kind of uh, going to be leading on this and hopefully uh, once we've commissioned it we'll start to think about commissioning a user program and eventually it will go on a user program um, and yeah so the team is getting quite big these days so there's quite a few of us um, there's a lot of people who um, look after instruments and do a, a lot of the local contacting we obviously have a kind of executive committee and page and director and then we've got people who so martin's helped us out a lot um with various things so um with that i'll say uh, thank you and uh, if there are any questions now's the time thanks dan um so yeah there's some some questions in in which i'll um speak out and you can answer so for, do you still need to use a, a tank for your liquid nitrogen coming into the crosses no 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 we, uh, everything's done through the pipes. So, I mean, there's obviously an external tank, which is, I think, 400 litres or something along those lines, or even, sorry, not 400, what am I on about? Um, it's a, much bigger than that. Uh, I can't remember what size it is, but, um, so that's filled up by the BOC guys. So essentially you don't notice anything. It goes directly into the microscopes. We've not seen any trouble really with the system. It's worked pretty well. That's good. <clears throat> so I know you, um, I know you uh, like alluded to this in your talk, but I've got a question here. Why do you use super resolution by default? Um, do you go for lower mag then? Um, and that's essentially, oh, so when we started with Serial EM, that was essentially what Serial EM did. So it was by default with the K3 uh, super res. So um, it doesn't make any difference in Serial EM if you use super res. So I just left it. And I think, you know, it does give you the opportunity that, you know, if you do hit Nyquist, you do have, I mean, the problem with, the problem with it is obviously the motion correction is, a, yeah, it becomes a little bit of a heavier task, but um, yeah. I mean, if you, if you really want to make EPU run faster with, with the K3, then you can switch EPU to right out counted you have to be aware that it doesn't do that in a sensible way <laughs> so um yeah and that's so there is still a still an issue with kind of epu and speed okay so that i suppose that leads on to another question um are your serial em collection scripts available to see somewhere are you you posting um them? so the script was originally something that um giuseppe um past me when we first got the K3, which I modified to use the um, image shift. So it's a it's a pretty basic, if somebody wants it, just to send me an email, I can send it to you. It's not super complicated. Okay, so we're talking about cameras. So I'll, um, do you have the same game reference issues on all your K3s or do some perform better than the others? Some perform better than others. So essentially, yeah, you can you can see it when you look at the actual gain reference on the chips. So some are much flatter than others, and some the two halves are closer to each other. <laughs> so it, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a random lottery, to be honest. Um, and you've the, got the, to look the at newer K threes that we've got on Cryos one and Cryos two are better for that than the certainly the one that we had on Cryos three was the yeah. It, that was uh, how should we say this effect that Wim was talking about earlier is you know if you 
do your kind of gain at one point and then by the time you've gone through your fairly thick object for tomography you've reduced that by half you would start to see the sensor so it wasn't gain correcting properly so this is about the your facility in general how do you structure your team across the different microscopes obviously some are more labor intensive such as the, the fib milling so is, is that a challenge every day or kind of um, we have, so for the FIB, for example, we have James who's dedicated to the FIB. He has Matt who helps him out. And we have some of our other beamline scientists who are FIB trained. Um, but we need to, yeah, the, I don't know, it seems to be quite complicated to get a lot of external user visits with the FIB. Uh, there's there's something that we need to kind of understand as to what would make the access slightly easier so that's something that i'd be interested to find out from people um we so most people start out they can do epu runs and obviously local contact with that and then it's a matter of us doing some internal training and then you can obviously local contact for serial em runs but it does make sometimes it's slightly complicated it's one of the reasons why on the kind of form we have at the front with the experiments we kind of like people to tell us what they're going to do because you know yeah it's just a matter of experience um okay so um can the the c to d and epud also collect tomograms um i don't see why not <laughs> I mean, that's essentially what the PUD does. It does tomography just on a crystal. So Sorry. Um, I'm not sure why you'd want to do that if you've got a direct detector. So um, just use, yeah, serially in. I mean, we are, so at, at the moment, we are getting a Selectris Falcon 4 put onto Crafts 3. And so we are going to obviously start with Thermos, Tomo software, and that has undergone some improvements in terms of it's now got the dosimetric scheme it's got mm -hmm. a couple of extra bits it's still yeah I, whether it's ever going to be as good as Syriam, i don't know but we can hope and um i'm just going to finish off with this so um someone's asked um can you access uh ebic uh, for japanese institutions yeah you can we take any any so the only uh, the only thing that we don't do, so the microscope time will be free, but they'll obviously have to um, find their, well, if they were going to come to site, they would have to find their own travel, but the other alternative is just the ship. Okay, all right, thank you. So um, I'm going to finish this session now. We have um, two speakers uh, about methods, and uh, the first speaker is uh, Erika Mariotta. She uh, did a master's in neurobiology in Rome, and uh, in 2017, she started a PhD in Martin Beck's group. And she's going to tell us about uh, her amazing HIV project in which she used a lot of different methods. And with that, I hand it over to Erika. So thank you. Thank you, Wim, for the nice introduction. And thank you also the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk today. So I would like to give you an overview of my PhD project. Um, which is also an example of what we can achieve uh, at the, as a users at the CryoEM facility at the MBL. And today I would like to tell you how combining uh, different type of EM te techniques such as CLAM cryoelectron tomography and also SAT tomogram averaging, uh, uh, we determine the morphology and the ultrastructure of HIV capsule directly inside these cells. So uh, cryo-electron tomography was uh, already performed on uh, intact uh, uh, HIV variants uh, uh, in order to obtain high resolution information of uh, uh, the HIV capsid. So inside the envelope, the HIV capsid has a conical shape, is composed by multiple capsid proteins that assemble in a lattice of hexamers and pentamers. So to define uh, uh, the, um, to visualize HIV directly inside the, inside the cells at high resolution is very tricky. And I hope I will be able today to um, deliver this message. So just a little bit of uh, biology background. Once the virus get inside the cells, uh, some variants will get stuck into the endosomes and other with, which are named uh, post-fusion cores, they will travel along microtubules to reach the nuclear envelope. 
So here, uh, the very, um, very transient complex name as pre-integration complex has to cross the barrier, which is represented by the nucleopore complex in order to deliver the viral genome. So in the nucleus, the viral genome has to be integrated to guarantee the viral replication. So um, we're inside the cell. So the uh, capsid is assembled to set free the viral genome. This is not yet known. And when I start the project, we ask ourselves, uh, can we precisely localize all these very transient events inside the cells in order to study the morphology of HIV capsid in the cellular environment? And if we can do that, can we also study the lattice assembly of HIV capsid? So um, in, in order to address this question, we use uh, uh, CLAM, cryo-electron tomography, and obviously we have to face a lot of challenges. And today my talk will be about these challenges and the way how we overcome those. I would also like to focus on uh, uh, the workflow that I've been using for uh, cryo-electron tomography and subtomogram averaging. And uh, uh, also I would like to show you several results that we obtained. So challenge number one, um, HIV is a pathogen that is classified at the biosafety level. Number three, uh, none of our microscope at Temple can work under these conditions. However, we have a microscope that uh, can work in a, um, BSL, under BSL2 uh, conditions, but we decide to take it easy and to make it even safer. So we produce several uh, particles that actually allow us to work in, under S1 conditions. But these particles, the characteristic of this particle is that they, uh, they are very similar to the wild type virus. So they can enter the cell, uh, they can go through reverse transcription of the viral genome, they can enter the nucleus, but they cannot integrate the, uh, the genome into the host genome, meaning they cannot replicate. So once we had our perfect system, so we use these particles to infect uh, a physiological relevant cell type, which in uh, HIV infection, which is a, a cell line of CD40 cells. And uh, we come to the second challenge of the project. How do we actually distinguish between uh, the post-fusion cores uh, from those that get stuck into the endosome? So the post-fusion cores are the only one that can enter the nucleus. And we were interested in studying the morphology of the, the capsid core only from the post-fusion cores. So we use a light microscopy approach that then, then we send it with, a clam, with the CLAM workflow. This approach relies on the, uh, on the labeling of the viral integrase with GFP or MSCARLAC and the labeling of the uh, membrane of endosome with a um, M-CLING probe fused to a, another dye. So in this, uh, in this way, we were, as you can see here, we were interested only on, in targeting uh, those virus, viruses that were uh, uh, fluorescent, were positive for uh, uh, the integrase GFP or um, scarlet, but negative for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, the M-cling staining. So as I said, we studied this workflow. Unfortunately, I cannot, uh, because of time reason, I'm not gonna show you the workflow that we use for uh, uh, correlative light and electron microscopy, but I want to show you that um, we were able by following the fluorescence and using this uh, method to precisely localize the virus in the cytosol, uh, also at the nuclear envelope, as you can see here, and uh, inside the nucleus, uh, performing electron tomography in this specific region. So we were very surprised, uh, surprised and very excited to identify the um, HIV capsid that uh, um, highly resemble those in intact variants. So they look conical and they also um, contain some density inside. Uh, contrary, inside the nucleus, uh, we also observe uh, that uh, this capsid goes to some uh, morphological change, they become tubular and they also lose their interior material, suggesting that at this stage they might go through uncoating procedure. So um, although we were very excited because for the first time we uh, observe HIV inside the cells at high resolution, however, at this stage we didn't really know if this um, structural change was uh, occurring uh, um, at the, before the entering to the nucleopore complex or once the viruses were getting in, inside the nucleus. And because of that, we decide to focus on the process of HIV nuclear entry. Uh, we come to the third challenge. HIV nuclear entry uh, is a very rare and transient event, so it's very tricky to visualize it. Um, we decide to perform, to we, we, because of that, we use a system um, 
where uh, uh, there is based on a single point mutation, the A77V mutation, the capsid proteins, this kind of mutant uh, was already shown to accumulate uh, at, the nuclear, uh, um, at the nuclear periphery. And we use the system to perform uh, uh, CLAM and also cryoelectron tomography. And from now on, I would like to focus on the workflow that we've been using for uh, performing cryo-T. So uh, you know that obviously the sample preparation is very tricky. Um, in our case, we've been, uh, after the infection of these cells with the mutant, we um, could directly transfer the cells on the M grids. And this is because the T cells, luckily for us, are cell in suspension. So this makes it easier. So then we uh, proceed after the application on the grid. Obviously, we could proceed with the, uh, the, the plunge freezing in order to pro produce a, a vitrified sample. And then as uh, um, we cannot image the cells uh, directly uh, without uh, uh, performing cryofilm milling, we transfer the grids in uh, uh, the aquilos, so which is uh, the, uh, current, uh, the focus ion beam scanning electron microscopy that we have at the uh, at Tembo. Uh, very quickly, I know that all of you, I'm sure, are confident with the system. Anyway, this is a dual uh, beam microscope composed by an electron beam coming from the top and an ion beam uh, coming from the sides, which is actually used uh, for, uh, to remove material above and below the area of interest. So contrary to what I've shown for CLAM, uh, the cryo uh, feed milling in our, in our case was not performed uh, by following the fluorescence of the viral integrase, but we decided instead to use a, a blind milling approach. Uh, the only, um, the only um, um, so for, for targeting the cells, we just um, target the single cells because are those that uh, vitrify properly and also um, those that are localized more or less in the middle of the square. So the cryofilm milling itself consists in uh, uh, four uh, steps uh, by applying a rectangular pattern that you can see here. Um, and the milling, uh, um, so we proceed with the milling until we get a final lamella of 200 nanometers. Um, so uh, per day we can uh, um, attemble, we can uh, uh, obtain up to six lamellas. And uh, for this specific project, uh, I have to mill uh, up to 100 uh, uh, T cells. So once uh, uh, we have our grids, we can uh, um, transfer the grids in the Tatan cryos and we take an overview of uh, uh, the lamella. Uh, this uh, is what we call lamella mapping, uh, and we use this map to navigate inside the cells and to target uh, feature of interest. Uh, so at this map, for example, we can already see the nuclear envelope and the nucleopore complex or several uh, uh, um, organelles like the Golgi apparatus, the endosome, or the mitochondria. In my case, because I was interested in uh, following uh, HIV nuclear entry, obviously I had to target the, uh, the nuclear, entire nuclear envelope that you can see here. And at this stage, I couldn't visualize where the virus was localized, so I had to acquire more data than possible. So at this step, we, um, I could obviously, I, so I um, proceed with the uh, uh, T series acqu acquisition of the Titan Cryos K2. Um, uh, using the following parameters. The tilt series when then aligned and the tomogram reconstructed using IMOD. Uh, for this project, we had to reconstruct tons of data. So we use a, a very brutal force approach. Uh, um, so, and uh, we acquire a, a total of 250 tomograms. And uh, among these 250 tomograms, only nine contain HIV capsid. So now at the AMBO, we have uh, uh, K, the K3. Uh, so uh, the acquisition of tomograms is uh, uh, much faster. Um, at that time, we need to, uh, for, each, for each tomogram, uh, we need more or less 40, 40 minutes. So uh, right from now on, I would like to show you three examples of the tomogram containing HIV capsid in a different cellular compartment. So the first one, in the first one, you can see um, an HIV cap, you can focus it also here, an HIV uh, capsid that has a conical shape and is localized in the cytosol. Um, the capsid reach uh, uh, the nuclear envelope and uh, uh, now what happened at the nuclear envelope? So the capsid does not disassemble as it was uh, 
previously suggested by other studies. But if you can focus here also, you can see in the tomographic reconstruction, uh, the HIV capsid reach, so the nuclear envelope get inside the central channel of the nucleopore complex, as also you can see from this segmentation. So the, this tomogram I'm particularly attached to because it was the first time that I could really visualize the, the virus. So an HIV inside the cells and it was super exciting. Uh, the same kind of result was also obtained uh, um, by performing correlative light and electron microscopy. So the third and last tomogram so that I want to show you is uh, of um, where you, so is this one? So here we can see uh, the HIV capsid that uh, changed totally morphology. So as already shown for the wall type, uh, the virus instead of uh, uh, having a conical shape, it gets tubular, suggesting that inside the nucleus uh, uh, some uh, st structural change is happening. Um, as uh, shown, ah, sorry. So as uh, shown uh, uh, before, also the same result was also obtained by performing correlative light and electron microscopy. So, so far uh, I've been talking mostly about uh, uh, some morphological change um, that is happening to the capsid, uh, going from the central channel of the nucleopore complex inside the nucleus. However, um, in order to um, understand what was going on and uh, if the lattice uh, was actually still uh, assembled in the ca conical capsid or disassembled in, uh, in this tubular, in the tubular capsid, we have to perform some tomogram averaging. So this is the workflow that we've been using. So we had to segment each virus that we uh, observe in our cryo uh, cryo uh, electron tomograms. Uh, and this segmentation was done with diamond. Then from the segmentation, we generated a volume. And from the volume, we extracted uh, um, uh, with a four time oversampling the initial subtomogram position. Each subtomogram corresponds to the hexameric unit. This was, uh, uh, each of them was aligned to, the, um, uh, to a, a published uh, uh, reference and then averaged. At the end, once we are happy um, uh, for the subtomogram um, averaging itself, we use the uh, NOVA um, STA package that you can also find in uh, GitHub. Uh, once we, we were happy with our um, results, we could uh, uh, place back uh, uh, in place uh, each uh, um, position in order to obtain the, the uh, 3D uh, structure of HIV core. And this was uh, um, done using the plugin in camera place object. So now I would like to show you some results that we obtain. Um, so from uh, the from the capsid that we we found out in the cytosol and the nucleopore and the, at the nucleopore complex, we could recover uh, um, part of the of the lattice. So if we zoom in several positions, you can see really uh, how uh, six hexamer um, are localized are around one single. Uh, um, hexamer, which is uh, really the sign of uh, the lattice. Uh, if we compare it uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, the results that were, was obtained from purified envelopes, you can also see how we actually uh, were able to less completely recover the, uh, the lattice. However, you know that in this case, so in a cryo uh, feed milled, uh, uh, in a cryo feed milled sample, uh, you have uh, um, some other option to consider, such as the sample thickness and also the crowd, the cellular crowdings. So in our case, we had a signal to noise ratio that was uh, uh, lower in comparison to this work. Um, so we were pretty confident that because of the overall shape of the capsid, uh, the lattice in the cytosol and the nucleopore complex uh, uh, can be considered in large intact. Instead, if we, if we uh, perform the same analysis on the capsid obtained the nucleoplasm, you can see actually how we recover even less uh, the lattice itself, suggesting that at this, at this stage, the lattice inside the structure is mostly lost. So with that, I would like to uh, summarize. Uh, um, so I, I show you today that uh, by using CLAM and cryoelectron tomography, we were able to properly localize the virus, the variants and study the morphology of HIV capsid inside the cellular environment. We also observed that HIV capsid are con shaped in the cytosol and the central channel of the nucleopore complex, but they are tubular in the nucleus. 
and uh, uh, by performing subtomogram averaging, we define the lattice assembly of the HIV capsid in the cytosol at the MPC and inside nucleus of T cells. So uh, if you are uh, interested more into, uh, in this topic, uh, you can check out our uh, preprint on Bioarchive. Um, so with that, I would like to conclude and uh, acknowledge all the people involved into this project. Obviously, my uh, boss, Martin, uh, Beata, who uh, performed the subtomogram averaging of the exomerit lattice. Um, the krauss lisch group and specifically Wojciech, who did uh, perform the correlative light and electron microscopy. And obviously, uh, our uh, um, uh, heroes uh, at the MBL, uh, so Vim and Felix, without them, nothing of this would be possible. And thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. That was a nice talk about your tour de force in microscopy. There's a couple of questions already. Um, one is, uh, would you expect a different behavior for wild type capsids? So the wild type capsids are those that I shown at the beginning. So um, we just did uh, correlative light and electron microscopy um, for that because, uh, as I sh uh, because um, unfortunately, as I already shown, uh, um, so the uh, process of HIV nuclear entry is very rare. So we wouldn't have been able to visualize that by using uh, cryo -T. Um, but yeah, so basically they behave exactly in the same way. And these, uh, if you want, I can sh like, uh, share again the slide, but they behave in the same way. Okay, uh, another one is, um, do you have any idea what causes the morphology change of the capsid once it enters the nucleus? So um, we believe that these might be dependent on uh, uh, the reverse transcription of the viral genome in, uh, uh, so the viral, the, the genome of uh, HIV um, is a, a RNA genome. And then during reverse transcription, uh, most likely the uh, synthesis of the double uh, strand can maybe uh, push um, uh, the capsid to induce the uncoating. So right now there are some uh, um, studies that shows that indeed uh, the reverse transcription might be happening inside the nucleus. Okay. Um, there's another question. Uh, is there a reason why you couldn't use the CLEM images to select where to mill? Yeah, so when I joined, uh, um, there was already a temple, or after a few weeks, maybe, or months, um, a cryoconfocal arrival temple. But at that time, the workflow was not very established. And also, um, at that time, we already had some uh, uh, CLAM results, uh, which um, actually showed that this kind of uh, um, process could have been, been possible. Um, and also we had some uh, IF staining um, that we did uh, on uh, uh, HIV capsid uh, for a day 77V mutant. And we basically observed, well, more or less try to understand which was the probability to find this event. And we saw that it could have been actually, uh, although very tricky, could have been uh, potentially possible. Uh, we always consider anyway that we could have done cryoclam in the worst case. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in all in this entire operation, and I've seen you struggling through it, what was the what was the biggest bottleneck for you in all these steps? Yeah. So it was very frustrating at the beginning to I have to say to go to the cryos um, and see that the lamellas were not there. Um, I think we obviously over time you get more experienced and um, um, yeah, you can somehow overcome all of these little problems. Um, I mean, not little, actually big problems. Um, and for the lamella specifically helped me a lot in uh, um, having these trenches uh, uh, that stabilize basically the lamella. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh... One more, and that was the last. That will be the last one, I think, to stay on schedule. Uh, it's uh, could the occurrence of fighting virus course could that be optimized by increasing the, the virus uh, uh, title, or are you missing things because of the milling strategy? I mean, how you know is that something that can be optimized? So um, I think the already the sample preparation was really optimized. We had to use a, a lot of virus. Um, and uh, this A77V mutation already um, 
like help helped a lot because obviously they localize really the nuclear envelope. Uh, so I think what maybe could uh, help on right now is the Tariuklam, most likely. So now that we have a system that works properly at Temple, this can maybe uh, be actually very uh, useful. Okay, thanks. I think uh, uh, to stay on time, I think we'll stop right there. There's a couple of questions left, but we can answer those in the chat. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much again. Um, with that, we move on to the next speaker, uh, Max Maletta. So we, I think we have an Italian session here. Um, so uh, Max has, a, has a, a PhD in biochemistry, postdocs in Strasbourg and in the National Cancer Institute in Amsterdam. Uh, worked for uh, uh, EN, which is a company that provides cryo-EM services. Worked at Nissan in the cryo-EM facility. Uh, also set up uh, cryo-EM in Amsterdam at the National Cancer Institute. Has done uh, everything, X-ray, NMR, EM. And in 2016, he joined uh, Thermo Fisher as a product specialist in cryo-EM applications. And uh, we will now watch a pre-recorded talk uh, about the a select risk filter at the Falcon 4. And after that, uh, Max will be able to answer questions. Good morning, everybody. My name is Max Maletta, and I work as product specialist for Thermo Fisher Scientific. Today, I will take you to a presentation that is meant to introduce you to our new direct electron detector, the Falcon 4, and our new and first energy filter, the Selectris. Let's start. At first, we will discuss the Falcon 4, our new direct electron detector that is provided of high throughput, a super DQE, and a new way of saving your data. Then we will move to an energy filter, the Selectris, and has very good signal to noise. It's super stable and also it's completely automated. And then I will show you some application results that are enabled by this technology. Well, let's start with the Falcon 4. So first of all, you have increased productivity thanks to 10 times speed improvement. Then the camera has the best DQE commercially available. It's provided with a new way of saving your data that's called ER. It can grant you full temporal and spatial resolution. And we also provide this camera with a robust data collection and project administration feature in the form of EPU data management and quality monitor. The first improvement of Falcon 4 respect to Falcon 3 is the speed of data collection. The Falcon 4 is 10 times faster than the Falcon 3. This thanks to high internal frame rate up to 250 frames per second. There is also speed improvement thanks to better electron event localization and we had a further reduction of overhead than the time it takes to transfer the data from the camera to the server. All that together uh, bring us the possibility to collect image at a speed that is over 300 movie per hour in electron counting mode. The Falcon uh, 4, for the first time, feature a new way to save your data. That is called EER, that meant Electron Event Representation. Normally, when you save your data in MRC format, what essentially you do, you collect the raw frames, whatever the maximum frame rate of the camera, and then you fractionate those frame rate in a discrete number of fraction, most often around 40 frames. Those frames after data collection are then compressed, in this example with TIFF compression, and you'll get the final size of your data. As you probably know, most of those frames, if you collect aiming for high resolution, so with low dose, are empty, so you have very few heat. For this reason, we found a smarter incentive to collect all the frames to just save information about the position where the electron hit the frame. So as you may see here, there are X and Y position and the number of the frame where this event has been localized. This allow you to have full temporal and full spatial resolution. The first means that you have no fraction, so you decide later on what to save and many fractions to have. The second one is that you have you may have sub pixel accuracy. Just to give you some number, because you know nothing matter without the number. 
here on the right, you may be able to see a typical size of a movie data set. So with a dose of, for instance, photoelectron, a pixel size of alpha and angstrom, each movie would be of the size of 240 megabytes. Recently, it has been published a paper that show how sub-pixel localization, or if you like, super resolution is possible with Falcon 4. This paper, as you may see here, despite the Nyquist was at 3.4, thanks to sub-pixel localization, they could see information up to 1.7 angstrom. As you probably know, the super resolution is not exactly a new thing, but I think with the Falcon 4, it become usable. So uh, with that camera, when you use super resolution and you save your data in MRC format, in order to have a four time increase of field of view, you need a four time increase of size. This has a cost because an increase of size I means it takes more time to transfer the data from the camera to the server. So then there's low data collection. Instead with ER format, a 16 times increase of field of view only require 56% increase of the size of your movie, meaning that the super resolution that is possible with Falcon 4 and ER format is manageable, so it doesn't require to extend the data collection time. Now we go to another topic and we start speaking about the selectors, the first Thermo Fisher energy filter. Once we decide this filter, we had three things in mind. First of all, we want the filter to be easy to use and to require as little as possible user intervention, especially during data collection. We also we want to enable very narrow slit with in order to allow to collect data for very thin sample SPA, gaining extra removal of noise, or if you like, extra signal to noise. And I think that's what we achieved with the selectors. Here's a brief explanation of zero loss energy filter that probably most of you will not need. The energy filter in life science is mainly used for zero loss energy filter. This essentially means that as you may see in the peak here on the left, the zero loss peak correspond to the elastically and transmitter electron, while some of the electrons get elastically scattered. That means that they have uh, exchanged heat or energy with the sample. So those inelastically scattered electrons may be filtered out, as shown here, applying a certain slit around the zero loss energy filter. In this way, removing selectively only the inelastically scattered electron, we can remove the noise from the image and gaining a better contrast in our image. The selectress has the characteristic to offer a zero loss peak position and is very stable. It's stable to temperature variation. And this, we call it invisible to the user, meaning that you don't have to center frequently. So as you may see here, this graph on the left, you will see that within 300 hours, the slit stay in the range of 10 electron volt. And most data collections you probably know occur within 24 hours. Uh, using those narrow slit allow us also to have an important increase in contrast. As you may see here, where a very small object has been imaged first with an unfiltered Falcon 4 and then applying a selectress 10 AV filtering. And you can clearly see I believe that in the image above, you can not clearly see anything, and the one below, you may uh, start seeing the particle. Selectors feature full integration and complete automation. Uh, I just want to remind you that uh, the time uh, scripting make possible to use serial EM and Loginon and Legendon with selectors. The zero loss centering need to be done essentially every time you start data collection, but almost never during data collection. So it's infrequent and it's completely automatic. I think it takes something less than a minute. The filter tuning uh, of the selected filter probably must be done uh, once per week or once per month by your uh, facility manager. And it's also completely automated. Uh, the full alignment of the filter 
is done in the factory and it need to be repeated. I would say normally by our service engineer in case you have you know some major operation with the microscope, like you do an upgrade and you open the column and stuff like that. So the combination of selecting and Falcon 4 provide you with very high speed of data collection, so a lot of throughput, more than 300 movie per hour, a very high DQE, the best DQE commercially available, a new way of saving the data, then is the electron event representation, that means more compression, but also mean a super resolution or sub-pixel localization, and also full temporal resolution. That's something we had discussed in detail. But essentially, you always collect the full frame rate of the camera, so you always have 250 frames to play. And this gives you a lot of possibility when you want to finally slice your electron density, as I will show later on, but also will give you the possibility to squeeze the best resolution out of your data. So recently, you may have seen a preprint on, on BioArchive where the structure of apoferritin was resolved using Falcon 4, Colfag, and the selectors energy filter at a resolution around 1.2 angstrom. At this resolution, you can clearly see uh, the proton. So th I think this is one of the first structure uh, that allow you to reach atomic resolution. Of course, no one cares so much about apoferritin, while most people have stronger interest for membrane protein. Uh, therefore, we, in collaboration with uh, MRC LMB, also try to get the highest resolution possible for a membrane protein, as in this case, a GABA receptor. And this receptor in particular was solved at a resolution uh, of 1.7 angstrom, where you can clearly see the interaction uh, between the ligand, the drug, and the drug ball pocket. And to my knowledge, this is the highest, highest resolution ever achieved uh, for a membrane protein by cryo electron microscopy. When you save your data with the electron event representation, you can do a very cool thing. It means that you can finally slice your electron density. So as in this case for the GABA receptor, you can identify which is the part of your protein, or in this case of your ligand, that is more sensitive to electron radiation. So in this case, they could observe the, the disulfide bond that is being reduced as, as soon as you increase the dose. So I'm a chemist, so I'm very excited about this kind of finding, and I think this will be uh, very relevant for people that want to know which is the most weak uh, part of the protein, of the protein ligand, especially for drug design. Another example that I'd like to bring up is the human hemoglobin. Then as you probably know, has been solved already uh, by Cryoam, uh, by MPI Martin's read at the resolution of 3.2 angstrom. So we did this experiment to show the effect of energy filtering on a very uh, small sample. And as you may see from the image, with that energy filter, we managed to achieve a resolution 3.5 angstrom. And with the energy filter, we could go behind and get a resolution of 2.7 angstrom. I think this proved whatever was needed, that the narrow slit energy filter really helped in improving the resolution of small object. And again, to my knowledge, this is the best resolution ever achieved on a human uh, hemoglobin. Of course, energy filters are also very useful for tomography. So in collaboration with MPI Martins Reed, we ran an experiment on Rubisco, and we solved the structure with both SPA and tomography, as you may see in this slide side by side. Thanks to the energy filter, we could achieve a resolution with tomography of three angstrom, then to my knowledge uh, is again, the best resolution ever achieved by subvolume averaging. Uh, therefore, we believe that energy filter, especially with narrow lead, may be very useful also for uh, tomography and subvolume averaging. The Selectris energy filter come in two flavor, the Selectris and the Selectris X. Both energy filter are designed for high stability, are very easy to use and bring you top performance in terms of signal to noise. On top of that, the Selectris X, then is of course the most expensive version, as an additional correction electric and optical element. This allows you to reduce even further the distortion 
of the energy filter. As you may see, for the selectress X, image distortion, chromatic distortion, and non-isochromaticity are much better than what they are for the selectress. This is my last slide. I would like to summarize what do we bring you with Falcon 4 and Selectris. I think the combination of those two tools bring you top performance, the highest possible DQE, the best signal to noise, highest throughput up to 300, I mean more than 300 movie per hour, of course in electron counting mode. And I would say especially uh, we struggle to make those instruments very easy to use in a way that even newcomers to the field or people that don't have experience with the energy filter can use them with ease and with minimal training. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, the organizing, for inviting me here to give this contribution. And I'd like to welcome any question you may have. Thank you very much, Max, for that pre-recorded talk. <laughs> we, have a, uh, sorry. we have a bunch of questions already. Um, uh, the first one is, so the, the stability, the, the, the improvement of the stability of 10 times, is that compared to a bioquantum, like a 10 bioquantum? Uh, so I think uh, it's, it's much better, I think, uh, the, the, the bioquantum, at least what uh, their report in terms of specification, the thermal stability of the microscope. And if someone has ever had some experience with the bioquantum, uh, that, that for instance may happen that overnight the, the slit, if you select a narrow slit, get a little bit in the way of data collection. I think this never happened uh, in our hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question is, um, so do you have different uh, tunings for the filter per magnification? Because one thing we see on the Gatan filters, and it's not really the Gatan filter, it's the microscope itself, that the last crossover in the pumping aperture as a different height for every magnification. And mm -hmm. for that reason, you then have to tune the GIF for every magnification. Uh, is, this, is this something that has been solved in the CRIOS or is this solved in the filter? So do, is, does the factory tune every magnification and we don't have to worry about it? So the factory tune more than one magnification, but I don't remember on top of my hand the complete list. So I will not be able to tell you right now. Mm -hmm. And as far as I understood, this filter is not water cooled, eh? so we're not depending on any any Correct. water instabilities. Okay, that's right. Um, yeah, regarding uh, the Falcon Four, um, so there's going to be a lot more data, but the data is also going to be a lot smaller. So what's the what's the net result in the end uh, for a facility, uh, storage wise and stuff? I mean, does it even out, or do we still need more storage, or have you done any calculations in that area? Well, so that's, that's a good question. I think we have not done any kind of, you know, thorough calculation, uh, but I think that the, um, the reduction size is uh, very significant. So I think even if in the future you will collect data set like in four or five hours, and I think it's probably realistic, uh, you will still have, a, you will still be able to uh, uh, collect most of the data set you need uh, for uh, I mean, with like 50 terabyte per week or something like that. Of course, this change if you decide to go for, I would say high dose. So if you use high dose, maybe for tomography, uh, then of course uh, the size may immediately become much more important. Okay, but, thank you. Uh, we haven't done any formal calculation. Okay. Um, list price wise, is what's the difference in list price between a selectors and a selectors X? Yeah, so I think uh, that I don't remember on top of my head, but I think that the electric then uh, with the Falcon 4 is of a, of a price and is, uh, I would say, a little bit more than the BioQuantum K3. While if you go in the direction of the Selectris X, uh, this will cost uh, something around half a million euro more. Okay. Uh, what's, what's the current speed limitation in movies per hour, if any? I, I think it depends a little bit by your uh, by your setting, you know, and what are you trying to achieve. But I think that, that I think if you don't have, a, I would say some, uh, I would say special setting that may be like a CS corrector, I think uh, there is no major limitation. So if you decide to go, uh, if you decide to explore at best Office and FFI, you can increase tremendously the amount of 
a movie you can collect. I think you can even get eight hundred or more. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for that. Thank you. In the interest of time, uh, we move on to a break. Welcome everybody to this uh, afternoon session on uh, image processing and analysis and uh, sample preparation. We have uh, two great speakers uh, lined up for uh, this session. We have Michael Chanfrocco from University of Michigan and John Rubinstein from uh, the Hospital for Sick Children. Welcome both and uh, thank you for, uh, for, uh, for the talk. So our first speaker will be Michael. Uh, Michael leads a research team in uh, the Life Science Institute at the University of Michigan, where he investigates the mole molecular details of uh, motor proteins involved in uh, uh, intracellular transport. He's also very uh, uh, involved in developing uh, cloud, com uh, cloud computing tools for electron microscopy in order to facilitate uh, its adoption and to remove barriers for uh, new users. Uh, give the, uh, the, the floor to, to Michael. Thanks, everybody. So I thought I would talk about the work that we've been doing to kind of help people with software tools and connecting them to computing resources. And so I think speaking with especially a group that's focused on facilities, I think we all can appreciate that structural biologists will come to you, to the lab, and say, you know, at a, they ask high level questions like, I want to solve the structure of my protein, is my protein in the nanodisc, et cetera. And what they get is this whole sort of slew of things that range from, well, we have electron microscopes and you have to have computing resources and you have your choice of software packages. Obviously we can all navigate this and it's not, it's not a terribly big hurdle, but it's still a hurdle. And it would be nice to sort of increase this, especially as we think about throughput increasing with all the new microscope implementations that are happening. Um, and so I think where I fit into this ecosystem is I think that there is a space for, let's call it generally cloud computing, which mostly means remote computing. Remote computing outside of your lab that can help you with both computing resources and software. And so I think the one way that this has been done is you could just sort of go straight to these public cloud providers called Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud Platform. And you could try and stream your data straight up from instruments all the way up into Amazon Cloud. And so this is something that, you know, the, the benefits of this, the reason you would even consider this, that there's no upfront cost, which is nice because you can sort of start using it without having to drop 10,000 US dollars or whatever. Um, I think the reasons you would consider using the cloud today would be if you really had to process something and you had no compute resources, if you also wanted to test software that required a very specific computing setup, um, and that, or if you want something that was very scalable, uh, meaning that you want to do lots of these things over and over again right now. Um, the, the downsides here are that it costs money and that the way they make their money is that it if you were to use it 24 seven, it costs more than if you buy it. Um, and I think there is also an upfront barrier of just accessing this requires IT experience. I think an example of where this can be used, though, is that you know if you roll back in time a few years when Warp was just coming out, this is a dedicated Windows machine with GPUs. And for us, we actually did this process of moving data up to a Windows machine on Amazon because we had no Windows machines in my lab that had GPUs on them that we could run Warp. I mean, that, test out, that let us test it, let us see that it was great, and then we got a Warp machine. But I think it was a nice example of flexibility that we could sort of just step into. Other ways that you can use the cloud, and I think this is definitely will probably resonate with a lot of people here, is using it for data processing workshops. And so um, what we've done in Michigan is we've run a workshop the last two years where users come in with their own data. We can handle their data, and we've ingested hundreds of terabytes. We distribute their data to a given machine for themselves. And on their machine, they have software already installed. And these machines had GPUs and CPUs, and they could come in and process their data. And then we would bring in developers or sort of power users to talk them through and let them analyze their data alongside tutorial data. Uh, I, I would really encourage this. This is nice. You can apply for these credits for free from these cloud providers. Um, and it really seems everybody as they're leaving, they're just, they don't want to stop using it. They also wish they could just have access to this kind of machine in the future. Um, and so I think an example that we did is that we've been messing around with tools on the cloud. I think one example that you could do is that if you can sort of add a value to the system of like making it easier to use, that's an example where cloud computing can be really helpful. So Rosetta is a really powerful modeling software, but it's kind of tricky to use, especially at first. And so what we did is we wrote a, you know, essentially a wrapper script that will take really simple inputs, take the data, run it on Amazon and bring it back to you. 
And the added value here was us doing all the backend parsing for the users, because there's a bunch of things in Rosetta that require you know, some changes that are not that clear to do. So all of this brought me to where we, had, we are today. So you can sort of tell that Amazon and Google are, are fine for cloud, cloud computing, but they cost money. And so this sort of cost has always been around and it's been a constant sort of you know, pain because it's flexible computing to the cloud, but also we would like something that's free for academics. And so it turns this now into a, a project, into a platform that we're calling Cosmic Squared, which is a free web platform for cryo-EM data analysis. So the idea is it's, there's no command line, users upload data, and then we run their jobs for free on uh, government funded supercomputers in the US. Um, this one is housed in San Diego. And then this would let people get their data maybe faster or easier. And so uh, the, the basic thing that we built is we built it on top of the San Diego Supercomputing Center, a web platform that users will connect to and we'll use this software moving service called Globus which lets us ingest terabytes of data using a web platform. And so this sort of, this has been a number of years of work at this point, and now it's, it's fully functional. And so what we have today are these software packages. So we thought in the beginning, well, Reliant is pretty compute intensive, let's offer Reliant, so we have that. Then we've been adding more and more tools. I'll talk about this as I go on, but I think now the question that we're trying to figure out is like, what's the biggest, what's the biggest um, benefit we could have for the community here? What could we do that's more than maybe just having a rely on job? Can we do more than that? Um, so that's where it comes into sort of this automated pre-processing that I wanna highlight that we did. Um, so we thought we have, we're sort of living on top of a supercomputer. How do we, what can we do with this? We thought, well, we can just sort of, let's see how much we can automate. So as you all can appreciate, pre-processing cryo-EM data actually has a lot of user specific judgments and a lot of parameters that you know, get in the way of people asking questions like, is my protein in a nano disk? And so what we realized that we felt like there was a lot of user subjective judgments that we thought we could capture into deep learning programs. And so one is just sort of identifying a good micrograph or a good, good image. Um, there's picking particles, but we didn't touch that because there's already great particle pickers out there like Priolo and Topaz. And then finally, how do you identify a good class average? So the goal was, can we just take raw data and output essentially quote unquote good particles um, back to the user to get let them know what's going on with their data? I think this point is, as we were working on this, we realized this is gonna become more and more important because the throughput on microscopes is getting faster. And so at one point in time, you could look at all of your data, but I kind of think that soon, no one's gonna be looking at all 10,000 micrographs anymore. And so it would be nice to have something that's like a sanity check that's gonna come in and help you know that your data is good. And so what we did is we trained a deep learning classifier that my postdoc jokingly called Mike Assess because it essentially was me putting aside different micrographs into two groups of good and bad. We trained it on in-house data sets, also empire data sets to try and give us a different, different sizes of things. And we also, you know, the, the key here wasn't, there's obviously different kinds of good data. The key was all the bad data. And so on my computer is a whole you know, horror show of micrographs that we've collected that are all different kinds of bad. Um, so what we, to show you what, the, what good images could look like, these are what good images look like, these are some of these from Empire, some of these are in-house, so you know, fine. Um, examples of what bad data looks like, there's obviously lots and lots of bad data, but I think the key that I would challenge everybody to do is that Obviously, if there's non vitreous ice, there's ways to filter that out. I think getting rid of things that are aggregates or, or maybe thick carbon um, can be tricky. It depends on how you're picking your particles and filtering your data, but these are the ones that are gonna have really good CPF resolution fits, um, but there may be our ways to do it, but it would be nice to sort of have, to capture sort of what the human eye would be doing to exclude the data. So we train this, it turns out it works, it works really well. And so we can give it any micrograph so in the top row, these are all micrographs that we have in lab. You hand these micrographs, it tells you that it's good or bad um, instantly, and it can identify them very well. And it's very accurate. It's obviously as good as the training set. And so we're improving that by increasing training sets. Um, but you know, we think this is, it's nice to get, it sort of makes me feel reassured that if I pass through 10,000 micrographs and this tells me all the bad ones, at least a human eye has sort of seen all the data. Um, so what can you do with this? So we sort of can do things. This is really straightforward, but if you just take aldolase, you take a bunch of micrographs and you can just sort of run it through this pipeline that we put together, which is our MicSS program, Cryolo, um, a diameter estimating step, and then the 2 dss what you get essentially are these class averages here, meaning that these are the class averages that just come out of the pipeline. And it was nice to see all the pipeline talk that's happening, seeing that facilities are doing this, 
um, with the rely on IT. There's definitely this is a trend to pipelines. Um, this is just one attempt at the pipeline. I think the nice thing here is that just would this program spits out class averages, and I think the reassuring part is you have sort of a deep learning or like a human subjective judgment happening by Mike SS in here. Um, I think a better test was we had a paper that we published last year on a protein called PREX1. We had many, many data sets. So we sort of did a post-mortem analysis of saying, we knew lots of bad data sets. Can this program essentially give us class averages that represent the bad data? And so this sample had a really terrible preferred orientation. And so this is the data set you know, with a preferred orientation. You can see that you know, there's some bad class averages, but they're mostly all one orientation. We added lots of things. You can see that this one had only one view class average that was good. All these rows here look like they're all the same, meaning they're all the class average, they're all preferred orientations. And this fine, this second to last one here looks different because we added a binding partner at a way higher concentration than we should have. And it shows you that this picked up that, yeah, there's something else in here that we didn't expect. And the final row is the good data set that we used for our paper. And you can see there's multiple orientations. And so the nice thing here is you sort of can go through and say, after you get these averages, you can look at, well, for any given data set, what's the differences between the good micrographs and good particles um, at each step? So you could sort of see there's weird data sets such as this data set was definitely an oddball because it had very few good micrographs. And then of these, of the pick particles, only a few of them were good particles. So it gives you a sense that it recapitulates what a human would have found, um, that if you were given all six data sets, this would have given you sort of an assessment. So, um, with that, we can plug this into our pipeline and now users can sort of come in and run the pipeline on this platform. And that was sort of the goal here. And so the question is, what else can we do with this? And so during this time, we were thinking about what software we could add. And so someone suggested we should add a program called Deep EM Enhancer, which is a, a, a deep learning sharpening program. And so in this case, I thought this would be interesting to highlight. So this is a really nice software package, um, the preprint here. And so the, the point of this that the, you could train a deep learning program to sharpen your data perhaps better than we would do normally with global um, P factors. And so they had some interesting results and it looked really nice. And so uh, I was talking with Oliver Clark and we said, let's add this into this platform. And so what we did is we it took me like essentially a few hours to add this software to the platform. And as soon as we released it, it actually quickly sprung up that lots of people like this. And so you know, on the order of 40 users have submitted a couple hundred jobs in the last month, um, which I think highlights that this software is not terribly hard to run. It requires running a, a Python package that yet you install with Conda. It runs for maybe an hour or two on one GPU and I think or on multiple GPUs. And so it's an example where the original, my original thinking with the software on this gateway was, well, people are going to want to use rely on because it's going to be so compute intensive. I think there's maybe something else in here, which is that trying new software that people maybe struggle to install or just want to test quickly, um, or stitching things together in ways that maybe wouldn't exist. So pipelines could probably live here, or unique pipelines, or it could be specific pipelines to users or software or just certain samples. Um, but to me, this is a, an example of where we should be thinking about what software that people would like to run, but maybe find a barrier to, to running it um, and what that could be. And so another example of software we've added is the CryoDragon software. Um, from Joey Davis and Bonnie uh, Duffler's lab. Um, so anyway, this, these are examples of things that we're thinking about. And so I think what I would like people to give us feedback on is what could we do with this? And so what should we add? And I think an example that I think about is I somehow stumbled across this really interesting um, genomics software that lets you stitch together software into pipelines. And so in principle, you'd love to have this for CryoEM where you get to sort of drag and drop things together into some GUI that then you could run. And so you can imagine a situation where you give us your particles, you give us some sort of pipeline script and we can run it for you. Um, and then we could host it for you or we could host that pipeline script and there could be different people's scripts available. Um, so that's, that's the extent of it. That's all I want to talk about today. So please give us feedback, comments. We'd love to hear it. Thanks. Thank you, Michael, for a nice presentation. We have a couple of questions for you. Uh, can users do training on data processing at uh, Cosmix? Right, yeah, no, that's something we've been thinking about is can we use this to people come in with data to run? Or we've been thinking more about like, well, if everybody's gonna run the same data set through, like let's say you're all gonna run the same April Faraday, should we just be hosting all the results so they can just download the results and simulate processing or to, yeah, I think it's a good point of using this for education. Okay, and uh, there is uh, someone asking if 
it's uh, free for academic users and also what is the access for uh, uh, for industry right yep so it's free for academics it's free for anybody in the world i think we're you know we're a little trepidation of this but it's it's free for everybody we're limited by sort of some limit on compute resource on this resource on this supercomputing center and there is a somewhere there's a hard limit on storage and so we have to have some limits around when a user comes in how much space they can use but for now we want to get we want to have this have an impact so everybody we're inviting everybody to come in um, and use it and right now yep we will sort of license and make agreements with industry if they would like to use it Okay, thank you. Um, how long does it take to get the new software update on the uh, Amazon Cloud computing? So on, on Amazon Cloud, that's just software maintained by me. And so it's as fast as I can update the software and keep up with CryoEM. <laughs> um, and so I think that's def definitely my, my focus has been more on this than on Amazon, on this Cosmic 2, because of I like the impact. I think it's going to be nice that it's free um, and available. But um, yeah, it is just a matter of me updating it. Then we have uh, another question regarding the class selection. Uh, someone is asking, um, what is the rate of false negative into the, uh, from reliant to the classification? And uh, are all good classi uh, classes generally recognized as a good? Yes, um, let me, it's a, it's a fair question. I, um, let's see, do I have that slide? Um, I, I can just show this slide. Um, so yeah, the question is like, well, how do you know, like the sort of the, what's good and bad. And so I think that's where we're trying to, tr we're trying to collect more and more of these class averages. Cause I think it's the same problem with micrographs and deep learning generals is to enumerate all possible bad and good. And so we did our best for this paper and we're working on expanding it to make it better. Um, and so I think the false positive rate, I think it, honestly, I feel like our program works great on all the data sets that we have in house, but I could imagine if someone walked in with something really different looking like a huge virus or some really different looking molecules that it could, it may not work as well. Um, the false, I forget the number in our paper, but it's definitely um, really, I would say probably in the 90th percentile of, of sort of accuracy. Then we have uh, another question which I suppose is uh, related to the, uh, to the Cosmic uh, project. How long, does it, uh, how long is the raw data stored for and how quick is the transfer back and forth? Right. So in that case, you're limited by the your networking. So your networking into this is going to be important for you. Um, the we use a globe this program called Globus. So it will be as fast as your networking will let you be. And so that that depends on where you are. Um, so Globus will move your data. So for us, where my building is, we're on really good networking, and so that means we get like 200 megabytes per second to San Diego from Michigan. Um, but that's going to vary. Um, the data policy right now is 30 days, but honestly, we feel like this is such a new project that we're constantly surveying users to just to get a sense of what's useful for you. Because again, I think for us, we're trying to help the community. And so if there's a certain time frame that people want, we can make exceptions or we can change the policy um, as it comes along. Thank you. Yeah, another question, uh, make access and 2D classes, uh, 2D assets, do they need to be retrained for unknown particles? So right now we we feel like they work generally, but I think that's what we're we're reworking the deep learning training to let users sort of tune it. So in deep learning, you can tune it for different for in general, you can tune things. So we could tune it for a sample if it's not performing as well. Um, and so that's what we're also working on is in the back end of making it so it is tunable. It seems so far it works for the samples that we use, but obviously it's, these things are all dependent on how much data do you show it. Um, and that's what so for us, what we have is a database of I think around 200,000 micrographs in my lab. And so we're trying to train this on all of them so that we could make it even better. Okay. Uh, another question regarding still micasses. Looks like a, a cool tool. Do you think, is there an application where you can manually sort the data and just delete bad micrographs to minimize the data that needs to be stored? Yeah, I know it's really tempting, especially right now, our, like, like everybody, our data storage is full. <laughs> and so it'd be really tempting to go through and remove all the like bad movies from your, from your storage. I, I don't know, I guess I'm not doing that yet. I, I, I like this program, but I don't trust it that much <laughs> to delete data that it decides is bad, but you, you could do that um, for sure. Um, or, or we can make it better and it could be really a good tool for that. That's a good idea. 
Another question is still regarding MECASAS. Uh, uh, is MECASAS during, uh, doing a binary classification or is a score assigned? So you could manually check borderline mix uh, micrographs. Right, so yeah, right now we're, so here's this sort of schematic. We were just doing binary, good and bad. Um, and so in here, there is a score that is when you're, when you're testing anything in, the, in these deep learning programs, there is a score and you have a threshold, you can say like, give me scores that are above and below this. So you can change a threshold that sort of relaxes how stringent it is. Um, you can see on the right for class averages, we actually did more than binary. We did good and then different flavors of bad, let's say, um, clipping neighboring particles, edge effects of micrographs are just sort of noise. So you could make this more, more informative and say, well, this, is, this image is empty, this image is thick carbon, this image is this kind of ice or that kind of ice. And that all just requires more data to, to bin these into different groups. Um, but yeah, and I think that, that gets at sort of what do we want? Do we want sort of general binary, like good or bad? Or do we want to go in sort of like the warp approach, which is segmenting based on this is this area is good, this area is bad. Um, our take was let's just sort of do a first pass that's not as fine grained as something like warp. Uh, would you consider at some point to add the software for molecular dynamics uh, driven automated model fitting? Yeah, I think that's, so that's, those would be great, especially on these supercomputers. They obviously run lots of molecular dynamic simulations. And I think for us, we're, keen on adding tools that people would use. And if, we, if that's a tool that would help people, then we would definitely add it. Um, you know, we're, so I'm sort of reaching out to lots of people right now to see what they could do. I think the only requirement for adding new software is the person, whoever is asking for the software to help us to get it running to start, um, especially if it's new for us to learn how to run it. And then once it's in there, it's, it's easy to add the tool on the sort of website. It's more just the, you know, learning how to submit the queue or submit the multiple jobs to the cluster. Um, but yeah. Perhaps we can move forward to the next uh, to the next speaker. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much okay. for, uh, for the nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is uh, John Rubinstein. John uh, did his uh, PhD at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology here in Cambridge. After his PhD and postdoc, he returned to Canada for a second uh, short postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Toronto. He started uh, uh, his own group, uh, research group uh, in 2006 uh, and six at this uh, hospital for sick children, uh, where he held a Canada research chair and he studied structure, structural molecular biology of bioenergetics and develops new method in CryEM to facilitate this work. He, uh, he has been recognized by, uh, with many awards, uh, by which we have a Barton Medal of the Microscopy Society of America, the new Invest Investigator Award of the Canadian Society of Molecular, Bio uh, Molecular Biosciences, the Lars Ersten Lectureship in Bioenergetic, and most recently, Doctorate of Philosophy at Honoris Causa from uh, Stockholm University. Thank you, John, for uh, joining us. You're well, welcome to start. Thanks very much, Giuseppe. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here filling a little gap in the schedule uh, and uh, I guess converting this session from uh, data analysis to data analysis and specimen preparation. And I think this is actually a nice topic for this audience because it often is the role of these large facilities to provide uh, new ways of preparing specimens that can help users solve problems that they, they come across. So my lab has been interested for a while in new ways we can we can prepare grids for some specific technical problems that we're trying to address on the biological side of our work. And that has led to some new uh, methods. And the project I'll be telling you about today is really a close collaboration between me and an extraordinary, extraordinary postdoc in the lab, uh, Yong Zi Tan. Our interest in the lab in novel specimen preparation methods really comes from seeing the work of the NRAM group, the National Resource for Automated Molecular Microscopy, led by Clint Potter and Bridget Carriger, uh, now in New York. And they're really uh, fascinating work with the spotted on device that uh, then became the chameleon device, which was enabled by the development of these self wicking grids. In, in this approach, uh, normal copper grids are used to grow copper hydroxide nanowires, and that moves the wicking capacity the material that removes excess solution from a piece of filter paper onto the grid itself and allows for high speed, low volume specimen preparation in the, the spotted on device and the chameleon device. 
uh, in our own lab, for quite a few years, we'd been making our own holy carbon grids. We published this method in 2014. And because we're able to nanofabricate our own arrays of small holes, we really have a lot of flexibility in the specimen grids that we use. Originally, this method was designed for making very small holes. Um, and actually, Chris Russo has a nice paper that's just come out suggesting that using small holes of around this size can dramatically decrease beam-induced motion. And, but the, the nice thing about our method is it allows us flexibility to test lots of things. Like we could test, and anybody who uses this method could test uh, the effect of small holes on beam-induced motion. And when uh, the NRAM group developed self-wicking grids, we could very easily try those in our lab. And so just to tell you a little bit about this method, it's a microfabrication, a microcontact approach, uh, microcontact approach to nanofabrication, where we have a, a pattern that can stamp a, uh, a design into a thin film of plastic that you then float onto a, a grid. Uh, and then you can evaporate uh, carbon or gold onto that plastic film and then uh, dissolve the plastic film to leave the carbon or gold film. And here's a picture of Hui Guo, a graduate student in the lab, uh, making a batch of grids. And you can quite easily make uh, 40 or 50 grids with an hour or two of work. And this is a, a method that's been used in a few labs around the world. As another thing that people might want to try uh, in their own uh, facility. So if you're going to make your own self-wicking grids and try freezing them yourself, you need to have a few different pieces of the puzzle in your own uh, high-speed grid freezing device. First, you need some method for applying the specimen to the grid. You need some way of plunging that grid into a cryogen. You need the cryogen bath itself, and you need some sort of computer control to coordinate all these processes. Our first foray into high-speed specimen preparation was something we presented also in the UK um, with this shake it off approach where we used a simple ultrasonic humidifier type piezoelectric uh, transducer to apply the specimen onto a grid that we then plunged into cryogen. The whole device is controlled by a Raspberry Pi computer. So this is about a less than hundred dollar computer which is really a full fledged computer. The new versions even have USB three and you can use that to control other electronics with these general purpose input output pins on the uh, Raspberry Pi. Uh, the first approach or the first prototype of the external electronics for controlling the plunging was this homemade breadboard. But one really nice advantage that we have in the lab is close interaction with Structura Biotechnology, the company that makes um, CryoSpark. And Structura, of course, is extremely good at computer engineering, but they draw as summer interns uh, very talented engineers with expertise in lots of different areas. So one talented engineering intern was this uh, young guy, Ali Hyderoglu, uh, who was an undergraduate at the time, uh, an undergraduate who had significant experience with electronics and actually built electronics for a satellite. Ali's actually now a PhD student in the UK in neurobiology. And Ali, as an expert in uh, electronics, was able to teach me how to take this sort of ugly breadboard design and turn it into a much nicer um, um, printed circuit board uh, that could be fabricated by an online service. So we now uh, have the files for this printed circuit board design available on uh, the lab GitHub. And you can send that off to this website PCB way and have this uh, printed circuit board fabricated. And it's really quite easy to do. The second part of the puzzle is this process of how do you plunge a grid? And for that, we turn to the really nice work done the CryoWriter device where they used a large solenoid where if you just energize the solenoid, you can plunge something about three centimeters. And so that's enough to take a grid from where you apply the specimen into a cryogen bath. And with uh, 3D printing and little plastic parts and magnets, we designed this little uh, a connector for tweezers. These are just standard L5 tweezers. We can hold the grid, connect it to the plunging solenoid and then apply the specimen. For the cryogen container, uh, we chose a very simple device. Uh, designed to fit into a standard Abcam uh, styrofoam box. And that makes it really easy. It turns out that finding an insulating layer is much harder than getting the actual cryogen bath. So getting one that fits into a highly, uh, readily available insulating layer was, was a nice feature. And this is a single piece of aluminum that's been milled again by an online service. And that works because of a, of a nice technique developed by Bill Tiffle and Grant Jensen's group. And Bill showed that if you mix propane and ethane, that can stay at liquid nitrogen temperature without freezing solid, different than pure ethane. And so we mix about 60, 40 propane to ethane, and that stays as a liquid when we fill this bath with liquid nitrogen. For applying the specimen onto the grid, 
I simply turn to a commercially available novelty ultrasonic humidifier. It's about $4 on eBay. And with this device, when you energize this little piezoelectric transducer, you can generate a spray. And this is a very ex extreme example of the spray, but with the grid freezing device, we do a much shorter spray to transfer some solution on, from a reservoir onto the EM grid. So you can just take that piezoelectric transducer out of the ultrasonic humidifier, mount it on another 3D printed, printed plastic part, and then that can be sprayed onto the EM grid. Again, this is a much more dramatic spray than we would use when applying specimen onto a grid. So the whole device together looks something like this. This is the, the, this is the first version of the device, the shake it off device. Uh, here's the interface run on the Raspberry Pi. You position the cryogen bath. Here's the liquid nitrogen, and there's the reservoir of ethane propane. Uh, once the cryogen bath has been placed, that engages a safety interlock. It's a reed switch that senses a magnet embedded in the styrofoam box. And this is to prevent accidental plunging of those very sharp tweezers with that powerful solenoid if the cryogen container is not properly placed. Once it's in place, you can click the ready button and that will advance this piezoelectric transducer into a position where it's really held very close to the grid. It turns out that one of the hard things to do is actually hitting the grid with uh, liquid uh, if it's not held close enough. You can then, uh, you're then ready to spray and plunge. So you place the tweezers, apply the specimen. It's just one microliter of specimen, hit the spray and plunge button, and now your grid has been frozen. And this is process is about uh, 90 milliseconds or so. And with the Shake It Off device, we're able to get quite nice ice. This is a typical grid, and the EM here is done by Hui Guo. Uh, whose name you also saw for the EER uh, method. It was done in collaboration with Thermal Fisher. Uh, Zev Ripstein, another graduate student in the lab, and Samir ben Lekber, our uh, excellent facility manager. And one of the typical grids that we would get with the Shake It Off device would look something like this, where you have what we call the mountain of ice, which is the central part of where the spray hit the grid, and then a thin strip of good ice. It's not a lot of real estate, but you can collect some good data from there and calculate uh, high resolution structures from that data. But that thin strip of ice really found was the limitation for people using this device because with the Vitrobot or the CP3 or the Leica, we're used to getting really large areas of ice and uh, that thin strip was kind of a discouragement for using it for biological projects. And so that's where we started thinking about new ways of getting uh, larger areas of real estate with these grid freezing devices. And that's where Yangtze came in, where I built this new device and Yangtze developed and uh, utilized this testing strategy to figure out when and how we can get this device to perform. So let's recap for a second how the different specimen preparation devices work. In conventional preparation, you apply a large volume to a grid, you blot away the excess that produces a thin film and then you retract and plunge. And this approach is really not very sensitive to adding too much specimen because the capacity for wicking of this conventional filter paper is really huge compared to the amount of volume that you apply. In the self-wicking grid, you send in a much smaller volume and there it's the grid bars that have the nanowires that wick away the excess that you can then plunge and freeze. And so the way that I like to think about this is with this plot where we apply a large volume and with blotting, we have the capacity to deal with that large volume until we produce a thin film and that thin film is actually relatively stable. Once it's been produced, it only thins very slowly from further wicking or evaporation, and we can freeze that. With self-wicking grids, the nanowires don't have very much capacity to absorb liquid. And so we can't apply too much, which is not a problem with a nicely engineered device like the spotted on, but if we apply too much with our shake it off device, we can't wick away that capacity. We can't wick away that excess liquid. But because we're only removing a small volume, we reach this thin film much faster and we can freeze grids extremely quickly. So the new, the new approach is actually to try to keep the capacity of the conventional blotting paper, but to move it behind the grid. So we have a very large blotting capacity um, and we, can, we're not, we don't have to worry about applying too much liquid with our coarse uh, piezoelectric transducer. So we put the capacity behind the grid. We want the liquid to wick through. We can then retract that wicks. We retract that and plunge and freeze. So then the next challenge, uh, so this device removes the idea, removes the upper bound on how much sample you can apply and gives us flexibility to get good ice even if we apply a little bit too much with a coarse or not very finely tuned application method. So we needed a wicking method or a wicking material that would allow us to do through grid wicking. And we can found that we could achieve that with glass filter paper where we 
we glow discharge both sides of the grid. And if you look at the glass filter paper, the slow motion video, you can see the liquid grows right through very quickly. Whereas with conventional filter paper, we don't go, we aren't able to wick through and we build up this meniscus on the top of the grid. And that's, that through grid wicking is probably due, we think, to the hydrophilic, very fine grains of the glass fiber filter. So we can demonstrate this device, this approach with a conventional CP3 device where we just remove one of the blotting pads, put the other pad behind the grid, apply a sample. And doing that, Yangzi was able to get a grid like this. It has regions with good ice. Uh, you can see some of the ice over here and a nice distribution of particles. So this is done not fast, but it shows that we can apply too much liquid with through grid wicking and still get reasonable ice. And you can see these uh, marks from the autofocusing procedure of the EPU software we used for collecting data. And here's one of the glass fibers on the grid. We then built a uh, device dedicated to through grid wicking. It's based on the back it up device, but with a few changes. We're still going to apply liquid on the backside of this piezo transducer, but the redesign is over here at the business end of the transducer and the through grid, through grid wicking material. So there's a new process mount and a new wicking assembly, and these are also available on GitHub. So with this device, we now have the glass fiber filter held against the gold side of a conventional, not self-wicking, holy gold grid. And we're going to spray liquid through the grid, retract the uh, glass fiber filter, and then plunge and freeze. And when we do that, we can, again, get good ice. Now we're getting about one third of the grid covered in good ice. And it's uh, the kind of ice that lets you get high resolution structures. So Yongzi was able to get this two angstrom resolution map of human apoferritin. We can also do membrane proteins. So here are a couple of samples of membrane proteins and detergents, some of the ATP synthases we work on the lab, both from yeast and Microbacterium spegmatis. Uh, and as you can see, we can get nice specimens. Uh, but the really big advantage of this technique is that it can also be done at high speed. If you spray a small volume, it doesn't take long to remove it by through grid wicking. So here's a high speed video uh, of uh, one microliter being sprayed for about 30 milliseconds. Each frame is about 2.1 milliseconds. And you can see that we can apply a small volume, have the through grid wicking occur, retract the glass fiber filter, and then plunge. And with this high speed video from my mobile phone, um, we can measure the timing and see that the overall process takes about 140 milliseconds. I think we can go faster, but this is what we used. And Yongzi used the same test specimen that was used to characterize the spotted on and show that high speed wicking can improve the distribution of views in a specimen that tends to adopt, adopt a top view. So with the CP3 and through grid wicking for about a five millisecond process, 98% of the particle images go into these top view classes and only 2% go into the side view class. Whereas with the through grid wicking with the, what we call the back up device and an overall 90 millisecond process, I'm not sure that's correct, um, we get about 66% of particle averages, particles going into these top views, but you can see that they are more tilted top views in many cases over here. And then about 34% go into these side views. And those side views allow us to get high resolution structures for this hemagglutinin sample that it's not possible to get uh, structures without tilting from a conventional grid preparation device. And you can see really nice resolution both in alpha helices and in beta sheets. Just like the Shake It Off device, this is extremely cheap to build. Uh, it's basically the same price as Shake It Off, about 1,000 Canadian dollars or 750 US dollars. And all of the design files are available on GitHub if you'd like to make your own. There are some safety things to think about. Um, it creates an aerosol, so you shouldn't use it with pathogens or toxins or infectious amyloids. There's no splash guard in this implementation, so you should always wear eye protection. And it's a very powerful plunging solenoid with sharp tweezers, so you should employ that safety interlock. So that's all that I want to tell you about. Um, it could be a nice project for a facility manager to do on the side to tackle some challenging problems. Uh, I showed you some data from the lab. Here we are at our socially distant uh, picnic a few months ago. And I showed you data from Samir, uh, Hui, and Zev. And this project really involved a close collaboration with, as a, with Yongzi Tan, as I said. So I'll stop there, but I'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you, John. Really nice presentation. Uh, we have a uh, few questions. So you already told us uh, what is the cost of the device. Uh, what is the cost uh, uh, of making grids uh, in the lab? How much does it cost per grid? If you um, so I think grids come out to about the cost of a grid, just a bare copper rhodium grid, I think it's about 10 cents a grid. Uh, and then if you factor in uh, the time, which uh, depends on who you're paying to do it or who you are, 
Um, so that's hard to, to give. And then there's the cost of evaporating the uh, gold or sput we tend to sputter gold uh, or evaporate carbon. So it's really, to a good approximation, it's about the cost of evaporating carbon. So we, we pay $25 every time we use a sputter coder. So a batch of 40 grids will probably cost us $25. Uh, somebody like Samir will have a 90% success rate. So we, we do look at every grid or screen them quickly on light microscope. Uh, so it's about $25 for a batch of 25 Canadian dollars for a batch of uh, 40 grids in our hands. So I think this technique is actually quite nice. Everybody in Toronto doing cryo EM does it. It's spread to all the other labs. And there are, I know David Stokes in New York has got this up and running. Um, Bridget, uh, not Bridget's lab. No, sorry, yeah, Bridget's lab does do it. Uh, but also Evan O'Gallis' lab is playing with this. I'm not sure how many people are using it out there, but it's really an economic way of making consistent holy gold or holy carbon grids. Uh, and you know exactly how old they are and you know how they're going to behave. So we really like it in the lab. And I like it because it saves a lot of money. Cool, thank you. Uh, we have another question. So by blotting uh, from behind the, the, the grid, so do you, see, do, you have any, uh, do you see any evidence that you can concentrate a, a specimen that is bigger than the holes themselves, like uh, fibrils or, and also have you tried to freeze uh, liposomes whole cells? Um, so concentrating, that, that's a really nice uh, question. So the, of course, back blotting was developed. I, the first instance uh, that I've found was from Linda Amos's group in Cambridge. Um, we haven't tried to concentrate specimens, but I think it would concentrate specimens uh, that can't fit through the holes. We haven't tried liposomes. Uh, Yangzi did try cells. I don't think it worked particularly well in that one attempt with uh, some E. coli cells, uh, but it's, it's really not where we've emphasized our effort. Um, now, there's a, with a high speed, you should always be aware that you will not get concentrating at the air-water interface if you do the experiment at high speed. So when you use a chameleon or a spotted on or a CO, uh, you don't get particles sticking to the air-water interface, which people don't realize we often rely on for getting a, a nice distribution of particles for things that do concentrate. So you'll need to use a higher concentration of protein than you would need if you allowed for concentration at the air-water interface. Thank you. Uh, someone is asking if there is any prototype where uh, uh, we can try, perhaps in the UK or in Europe. There are prototypes in more places than I know of. I think I, I know of about six or seven that have been built in the UK. Yeah, there, there are quite a few prototypes out there. Um, I, I know of only about uh, less than 10 or so, but I'm hearing about them occasionally. They're, they're really quite, for anybody who's uh, done 3D printing, they're really quite straightforward to, to build and people don't always tell me when they build them. Do you have any plan to commercialize this device? So I, I'm a, a big fan of engineering. Uh, we see what that does with the Selectress filter, how engineering can make things better. That's not my lab's uh, expertise, uh, but would certainly be interested. Uh, I think and I think this will always be a fiddly device when it's built by academics. And I think if it's going to be a really user-friendly, robust device, it should be commercialized. So it's something we're absolutely open to, and I'm hoping that that will happen. Cool. There is another question. Bob Glaser has an interesting paper showing uh, air fingers, air fingers caused by filter paper that might cause problems to uh, macromolecular complexes. Do you think wicking using fiberglass filter might uh, be useful for a more traditional blotting based method? That's a good question. Um, I think is, I, I would like to see how the experiments uh, play out for that. Uh, certainly the glass fiber filter is a faster wicking material. It seems to pull the liquid much faster. It has been used before. Uh, Tolman used it for blotting away uh, strong acids for nanoparticles and strong acids. So we definitely, I, we thought we had invented it, but it turns out it had been done before. Not through grid, but just using glass fiber filter for, for blotting. Um, I think, uh, I'd, I'd like to see how it works. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, it's worth a shot. And this is stuff that's readily available from, from BWR, uh, or, or Fisher, so anybody can just fit it in their CP3 or their Vitrobot or their Leica. Someone is asking is if you still using a Quantifoil at all, or you switched completely to- uh, We haven't yeah. used Quantifoil. So our problem with Quantifoil was in uh, reproducibility, where we'd get a batch, optimize conditions, get a new batch and conditions wouldn't work. Um, with the homemade grids, especially with carbon, we would only use them for a month before we'd throw them away because we thought the properties changed too much. 
Uh, we're finding that if you sputter gold, they last longer. And so people tend to push it a bit longer, but it's visitors will come by the lab and they'll look at people's benches and see hundreds and hundreds of gold grids sitting on people's benches because people make many batches. And for us, removing that barrier of having to pay a significant amount of money for each grid encourages optimization of specimens. And so we do a lot of iteration on making grids, freezing them, looking at them on our 200 kV microscope before we ever get to the Creos. And uh, that's extremely valuable. So our Creos is really churning out high resolution structures because specimens are highly optimized. And I think getting rid of commercial quantifoil has helped us a lot in improving the quality of specimens that are, are going on our Creos. Because I have a question as well. Can, do you, can you uh, change the time for the weeking? I mean, that's the program allows you to... Uh, yeah, absolutely. And so and you we've done experiments... Uh, change the offset. Sorry. Change, sorry, the, by the offset, you, you mean the time? Like or? the touching, the, the, the filter paper. Can you make it a little bit uh, further away or uh, push more like Vitrobot does? Sure. So it's like the blocking force. In a painfully manual mode. So everything here is just on a retort stand or a, uh, so you just adjust things by yourself. Uh, but in principle, yes, you could, with a better engineered device, control that uh, in a, a more reproducible way. What I think, I think what the reason why this works is because once you've formed a thin film, it's relatively stable. I remember doing an experiment with Richard Henderson when I was a student, where he showed that you'd make a film, remove the blotting paper, let it sit there for a minute in a humid environment, and then freeze it, and he got a good layer of ice. So none of this would work. Blotting would never work if the timing were critical for you have just the right thickness of film and then you have to plunge and freeze. Um, it's the reason why this works is because once you form the film, once you form the film, everything is relatively stable and things are less sensitive to small variations. Um, but I think you could put more pressure, less pressure, and that'll have a little bit of an effect. But in general, I think the, once formed, the film is metastable. And from your, your experience, is it difficult to, to build a shake it off or back it, uh, back it off? Is, yeah, I mean, we know the price, but uh, in terms of challenge for a uh, uh, facility person or for a student, is it a difficult project to I understand? think somebody who's technically minded will find this very easy. If you've ever done maybe a little bit of soldering in your life or you like playing with machines, if you are not a technically minded person, um, maybe there, there are more challenges. Uh, but I think this field has lots of people with great technical abilities who really enjoy a little bit of Python programming, a little bit of electronics, and then it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's been a, been a really satisfying uh, thing to work on. We, we have another question. Are these protocols for uh, grids available uh, so they can reproduce them in house? Yep. So the paper is published uh, in 2016. Uh, it hasn't caught on tremendously, but I, I know a few people quite like it. Uh, it's a little bit finicky. So as I said, all the groups in Toronto, uh, there are about four or five groups now using it and it's completely easy for them. Um, I think people who've tried to get it up and running entirely independently sometimes find it a bit challenging, but, uh, but people have done it. Uh, so maybe we should have a workshop where people come over and Samir just shows them how to do it once. It's really very easy once you see, it's like many things in EM. If somebody shows you hands-on. It's really easy. But uh, as I said, David Stokes uh, did a beautiful job of with almost no interaction, almost no questions. He's now producing these grids very routinely. I'm not sure how many other people have invested a little bit of time needed to do that. Thank you very much, John for, uh, and uh, Michael. For uh, Thank you both for the nice presentation. Brilliant. Well, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Giuseppe, for chairing the last session. What two fantastic talks to finish off um, the couple of days program. So thank you so much to everybody um, who's spoken today, yesterday, all of the session chairs, um, everybody who's chaired the breakout sessions, um, uh, been panelists, and of course, to everybody else who's attended the meeting as well and has contributed um, in a range of ways. Uh, just wanted to uh, finish off today's, well, finish off the meeting really, um, by looking forward as a community and thinking what are the challenges that we're going to be facing um, over the next, over the next year. And I thought a nice way, uh, and what we're hoping to do over the course of the next 40 minutes, just to finish off, is really to get input from, um, uh, from a range of, uh, of people on the call. Um, but just to kick this session off, uh, thinking about where the challenges that EM facilities are going to be facing in the next year. 
I just wanted to invite the um, session chairs from this morning's chat sessions, uh, which were the breakout sessions, um, uh, just to give a quick summary of, uh, of the key topics that came up um, in those discussion sessions, because I think that might give us a nice um, flavour for the kinds of uh, things that we're all facing um, in our communities. Um, so to start off with, um, I'm just going to ask Emma to say a few words about um, the EM training um, breakout session. Yeah, thank you, Becky. So um, yeah, we started off the morning today talking about training in EM. We had Alistair from EBIC and Felix from EMBL as the panelists. Um, so as you can imagine, the basics of our training, we were talking about COVID and, and, and what this will affect, this will have on our training. So um, obviously difficulties um, and different rules at different institutions as well it seems so different rules at EMBL to there is at EBIC but those rules are changing um, as the time goes on and with different um, local restrictions. Um, we all agreed that face-to-face -face training is is the best but but not always possible um, so and some things really do need to be face-to-face -face. for example um, sample loading by side entry holders of cryo, for example, and, and that sort of training is on hold at the moment um, at EMBL. Um, and there are other um, sorts of training like the, the dual beam fib uh, at EBIC that also requires some um, quite getting quite close basically to each other, but that can be risk assessed um, and trainers and trainee can wear face protection, so face coverings um, and try their best to stay a distance away or reduce the amount of time that they're in, in those close conditions. Um, we discussed um, op, um, options for remote training. So for example, um, microscope stimulators was one thing that Alistair quite liked the sound of um, that might be good for a training tool. And um, there's all sorts of remote access options such as team viewer and no machine. Um, do, do, do. But then we discuss the different tiers of training. So for example, um, there's the beginners, but there's also intermediate training. So beginners are, are quite more difficult to train um, for, for, with no face-to-face -face contact at all. Whereas intermediates who have a bit of uh, prior prior AM knowledge might be easier to give completely remote access. So videos or, or training resources for them in, in a self-directed learning sort of way. Um, we talked about adding webcams to microscope rooms so we could do sort of face um, training in that respect um, and use social distancing where, where, where requir required. Um, there was a suggestion um, to make a, a light version of, of different software packages like uh, Legend On and Serial M to make them a bit easier so you haven't got all the buttons in your face when you first um, go on to Serial M for example. Um, to make it a bit easier for people who haven't used this technology before. Um, do, do, do. And we did touch a little bit on um, different protocols at different sites and can we think of a way to standardise these so people can use a cryos at one institution and then go somewhere else and, and have, have a similar sort of protocol. Um, and, and obviously um, faculties can have wiki sites and videos and good training documentation that will, will help. So, so basically just to sum up the main challenges for the next year are COVID, social distancing, um, and that will limit our face-to-face -face training. Um, and even though that's not ideal, there can be some ways to get around that. Um, and I've mentioned a few already. So that's thank great. you. That's great. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, and uh, yeah, I think um, it is going to be really interesting to see how that goes in the next in the next year. And I think maybe we'll come back to how we can best share information amongst the community um, a little bit later. Um, Christian, if I can ask you to give a brief summary next um, on the um, EM data collection pipelines and microscope operation breakout. Sure. So we we basically managed to cover three topics. The first was we discussed how facilities manage screening at the moment um, with the larger you know, demand on screening in general. Uh, we also discussed sample requirements for accessing high-end data collections. And we also discussed a lot about who is actually operating microscopes uh, to ensure that the microscopes are always running uh, in the best possible way. Um, regarding how facilities manage screening, we first 
kind of figured out how facilities are doing this. Some actually don't offer screening, some do offer screening. Um, we even had some people reporting that they successfully screen with side entry holder machines and can get a decent number of uh, people uh, through these, uh, this infrastructure. But we, we also got um, to hear that if people have the choice between side entry and autoloader machines, they gradually go to the autoloader machines and don't use the side entry machines anymore, which is kind of, uh, I guess, a natural thing if you think about throughput. Um, we also discussed how, how people organize screening of um, lamella and tomography samples that are very fragile. And I think there was a pretty strong consensus that uh, these kind of samples are exclusively screened on the cryos, uh, potentially connected with an immediate data collection slot afterwards, um, because these, sam these samples are just way too sensitive to, to accept many transfers. Um, for the facilities that charge um, money or fees for screening sessions, there was also a brief discussion on how they would actually handle sessions that are unsuccessful. For example, a user brings 12 grids and, and has booked like two days and suddenly after eight hours, they find out all grids are bad and they cannot make use of the second day, for example. And there have been different models around. They all come with like advantages and disadvantages, of course. One model is to only charge days that have been started. So each 24 hour slots that had, had been started to be used is charged, everything else afterwards is not charged. And then of course the facility is required to fill up the space, which can be tricky sometimes. Um, another model we heard is that people charge on an hourly basis, but this comes with the complication that you, the facility staff has to coordinate with the users very tightly uh, in case they want to stop using their slot um, earlier than expected. Um, but these are the, the current um, ways how facilities tend to handle um, screening requests. Uh, in terms of machines, I think ex aside from the side entry holder machines, people usually use Laceos and Arctica machines for screening um, and collecting initial data sets, of course. But I'm pretty sure I asked, but nobody replied really, but I'm pretty sure there's also facilities around where they do screening on cryosis for standard single particle samples a lot. At least this was the case last year when we had this discussion. So I guess it didn't change much. Um, then the sample requirements for high access to high end data collection um, was a, a pretty interesting point. We spent a lot of time on it because it actually seems to, to change and I think you can see it because different facilities actually apply different standards. And the requirements, they actually range from nice looking micrographs where you can see particles up to uh, they ask for 3D reconstructions of, from initial data sets. Um, let's say the, the, the consensus was in the range of at least good looking convincing 2D class averages from cryo or negative stain as a minimum. Um, it was also discussed that based on the demand that's imposed on the microscopes, these, these barriers can actually change. So if there is a low demand, then maybe it's a bit more easy to give access to, um, to the microscopes with samples that might not look as you know, mature as others. Um, we discussed a few things on negative stain, but um, this was more side notes. I, I took all these notes, so maybe Becky can distribute it later. So there's also all the notes about the negative stain in there. Um, the last important point was that we discussed who is operating the microscopes, how, because um, I think in one of the last, late, last instruct meetings, I think in Leiden, there was a question, what's the biggest challenge for a facility manager? And I think everybody agreed that, um, it's many, many times it's um, um, the users and the samples and, and the users in particular that um, might actually um, hand, might not handle the microscopes the way um, that they can run for a long time, uh, very stably. Most facilities distinguish different user group levels. So either like non-touch users where they, the users just join to, to swap, support the decision-making um, 
this is especially used for remote sessions, uh, if I understood this correctly, uh, and also with external sessions like iNext and Instruct in, in some institutions. Um, additional uh, levels of, of um, experience are people that are, let's call them normal users that are trained on how to use EPU. I think we had a lot of this discussion uh, earlier with users that just learn how, to, I think uh, Dan from, from Diamond uh, said this today, that they're just trained to use EPU and that's it. And some facilities even allow um, super users that are more or less trained microscopists but still, I think most like most facilities actually don't allow users to touch um, alignments and things like this, or at least try to not have users touching alignments, even for the super users. So my feeling was that it was more exceptional that users actually touch alignments. And if then this was only for internal users, basically. Um, yeah, I think that that's definitely a trend that we see. I think majority of facilities are saying hands off the alignments, which is exactly. interesting. So I maybe know... it Sorry. arrives in the field what Wim is praying <laughs> for years now. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Christian, for taking such detailed notes. And we will try and arrange for those to be made public alongside um, the recordings associated with today's session so people can go back and have a read at their leisure. Um, but I know well, all of the breakouts had um, a lot of very wide ranging discussion and all of them, uh, the discussion was very much in full flow when we had to close off the session. So I think that probably tells us that maybe we don't have enough opportunities to talk uh, on these kinds of on these kinds of topics. Um, uh, but anyway, Co uh, Colin, would you mind just giving us a quick summary of your um, data collection and processing breakout session? So yeah, we had a, a good discussion. Our panelists were um, Carlos Oscar Sarzano, Dimitri Teganoff, and Matthew Danza. Um, you know, we had a good active discussion with contributions from people from quite a few different facilities. Um, one important point that was initially raised in a nice introduction by Carlos Oscar is that there are two distinct goals for automatic processing. One of these is on the fly live monitoring and feedback to assess microscope performance. And the second is to automate the production of end results for users. Um, and interesting, people highlighted that the, the second of those goals, automated processing for results, is actually more important on screening microscopes, where often the kind of results you can get from auto processing, such as quick CTS statistics and 2D classes, are actually the intended end result because that's what you're going to use to apply for your cryos time. Um, on higher end microscopes, such as cryos, um, people generally want high quality results, and that process can't be fully automated yet. So the main use of on-the-fly processing on those kind of microscopes is simply to get the fast feedback for quality control and decision making. Um, people did also highlight here the importance of regularly running benchmarks with well-behaved samples such as apiferritin on each of your microscopes, which allows mo performance monitoring over time and identification of problems. In this case, having an automatic and standardized pr processing that gets you all the way to a 3D structure is very helpful. Um, a common challenge that a lot of people are having is about the technicalities of moving data from microscopes to the storage and processing computers. At the moment, every facility seems to do this in their own bespoke way, but it would be nice if we can try and find ways to standardize this if we can. Um, and then we have a bit of a wish list of people's um, preferences for new developments on processing software. One is better tracking of metadata and results, both for feedback and visualization, and also for decision making in the processing pipeline. People would like speed improvements to handle the increasing data, result, data rates from new detectors. Uh, and people would really like it for, for the sake of the end users if we can have better automatic processing results that are more immediately useful for biologists, for example, for planning their next experiments at the bench. That's brilliant. Thanks, Colin. Again, a very lively discussion session, lots of activity. Um, so I chaired the final breakout session, which was safe and sustainable operation of EM facilities, which is probably wins the award for the most wide ranging uh, uh, title for any breakout session. But we essentially covered over three topics, um, coronavirus, safe operation, and we've discussed much around that. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go over that. But I do want to highlight that the Royal Microscopy Society ran um, a really interesting series of, of webinars on um, essentially COVID safe operation for all EM facilities across materials and biological sciences. And you can access those on the RMS website. Um, so if you can't find the link, just drop me an email, but um, they, they cover lots of aspects like how to make sure people aren't contracting coronavirus via eyepieces, for example, on those webinars. Um, 
we then went into discussing um, how we operate in biosafety level two um, and, and also three. Um, big thank you to the panelist um, Bilal from um, OPIC in Oxford um, for his contributions to that because they have some experience working with BSL three specimens. The main takeaway from that part of the discussion was that there's a real variety across facilities in terms of how you handle BSL two samples and lots of uh, different implementations of how you work with those BSL two samples safely. And I think that one of the outcomes from that breakout was that it might be quite useful for the community to draw together some of those ideas and approaches in a way that could be published and made available to the wider community, because these are the kinds of ideas which um, you know, there are lots of different approaches. And I think that sharing those ideas could be beneficial um, for many people. And then finally, in that session, uh, we touched on um, something which I'm going to put my hands up and say was not particularly on my radar until fairly recently, and that's the environmental sustainability of our facilities, thinking about, um, uh, especially in light of coronavirus, how we can improve our environmental footprint by reducing the travel of our users. And that um, it happens to tie in quite nicely with lots of the ways that we're changing our operation around coronavirus. Um, but we also spoke about in our lab space, the kind of um, things um, which, uh, which we could look at and uh, for example, things like how can we reduce single use plastic? And um, we had Laura um, from the University of Leeds, who's one of our sustainability advocates, and she gave us the statistic that 2% um, of single use plastic worldwide is used by scientific researchers. 2% of all of the plastic, all of the single use plastic in all of the world is used by, uh, is generated by scientific research. And um, Laura made the argument that we can all make small changes in our own labs to reduce the use of things like, uh, for example, falcon tubes to make buffers in when you could use a glass beaker instead. Um, and we didn't have a lot of time to touch on that, but I think that the sustainability of our facility operations is probably something we were all going to have to be thinking of um, more in the future. So that was really great to have Laura's contribution to that. Hopefully that summary of the breakout sessions gives you a feel for some of the key topics um, uh, which have been raised over the, over the course of the meeting. Now I wanted to go on more specifically to talk about some of the things that have come up and see if we can generate some kind of actions or community consensus on things. So um, first of all, just wanted to, uh, Wim, if you want to unmute and uh, just, we were having a conversation which actually fits in really nicely with John's talk around grid technologies and, and provision of grids. So the floor is yours. Yes, uh, my question is more, uh, so yesterday I asked Michelle about the quantifold delivery times and she explained that they were not doing that. She was kind enough to uh, uh, trigger quantifold who have contacted me and to discuss this. Uh, but, you know, before I talk to them, uh, I'd like to first kind of find out, uh, are we the only ones that have a problem with quantifold delivery times? And then I think, especially when you order them from quantifold, I can understand that resellers is a completely different story. Uh, but we tend to go straight to quantifoil and i was just wondering if anybody uh, can chip in anything for that and for that now in the chat i'll put my email address and if anybody has anything to say just pop me an email with the subject quantifoil and then i can gather some information and see you know where we are they've admitted that they had problems in the past and are working hard on improving the situation uh, but i would like to hear some stories from, from people and then i will discuss it with them and I'll just jump in real quick. I think it's a great idea for women you to collect all of this and to be kind of a spearhead and communicate and all of that. But I would also just encourage anyone who is, you know, struggling or who is, you know, dealing with difficult lead times to get in touch um, with Quantifoil or with me. And I can kind of do the same thing that I've just done with, with Wim and kind of put the two people together so that communication can happen more easily. So yeah, if anybody just wants to get in touch, um, uh, directly with Wim and maybe um, we can uh, put a little so this is an open question essentially where you know is there a good forum for us to um, you know collect and collate this kind of information I think there are different options out there but I don't think there's anything that's really working as a community hub at the moment for facility managers and facility um, associated staff um, so, for, for example, we have um, uh, or we, we set up um, a Slack group for EM facility managers, um, ooh, gonna go a year, possibly slightly more than a year ago now. Um, it's not very active um, and 
there may be many, many reasons for that. But if anybody does have any ideas or suggestions about what might work well as a community hub for us to put, for example, when women's collated all of this information, and I think there'll be many people who do email you, um, it would be it'd be great just to have somewhere we can put that kind of feedback and information. But I, I, I think um, I don't really know what that necessarily looks like or whether we can do something to um, Im improve essentially having a hub for like minded people or people who are in similar roles and facing similar challenges. I know that there are plenty of other um, uh, hosting sites other than Slack as well, which may be more or less appropriate. So if anybody has any ideas, suggestions, then please do drop me an email because I think it'd be nice for facility staff to have a safe space. Think... So moving on, I've very kind, well, several of the uh, people who've been attending over the last few days have very kindly agreed um, to let me pick on them and to um, uh, discuss some of the challenges uh, which they're going to be facing in the next, um, next few years. And although most of the attendees are from academia, it's actually been brilliant to see so many colleagues from industry joining us over the last couple of days. So, um, Katie, just wonder if I could invite you to take the floor and just uh, from your industry perspective, just give a view on what you think your challenges are going to be in the next year. I think it's probably similar to, to everyone else. Um, actually, Michael's um, talk just now maybe uh, links into what I was going to say. I, I think the biggest challenge or the biggest bottleneck for me is that it's great that we've got um, a lot more data coming through, um, which effectively means we can solve more structures in the same amount of time. But the compute that we need to be able to do that um, it is, uh, is a problem, it's a challenge. Um, and I've been trying to figure out what I can do about that. Um, and it made me smile in your talk, Michael, when you said about going to um, AWS and that you need to have some understanding of, uh, of IT solutions. And I certainly found it very challenging. Um, and to be honest, in the end, um, got a bit fed up because of the number of meetings that they wanted to have with me, uh, where they wanted me to explain exactly what my requirements were. <laughs> um, so um, I, I'd be, there's that side of it, if you're looking at a potentially a cloud solution. Um, but then equally, if you want to um, purchase your own nodes, it feels like it's um, it's difficult to know as well what uh, at what point are you over engineering um, you know the solution um, what what is what do you need uh, and what don't you need um, is 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 the challenge as well so um, I'd be interested to know what other people um, uh, think about all this. I think the over engineering is a fair point. I think there's a lot of people who can, there's a lot of fancy ways to do computing solutions. And that, that's one appealing thing of having these like dedicated GPU boxes that it is like under control for people to do things. It is a question of where it has to live and it's tricky. I, I agree, I think it is, I think being inside of universities gives us some benefits, um, also some downsides, but some benefits of being inside of a bigger community. Isn't this also maybe a bit of a problem that um, we're used to spending a lot of money on microscopes that's something we're used to uh, and everything else we're not used to. Uh, we, we are now right in the middle of the process of getting used to that we're gonna have very, uh, we could be having very expensive sample prep equipment, for instance, coming up. Uh, um, and it's the kind of the same with computing that it's just something that hasn't been on our radar for, you know, in the past. In the past, it was just that, you know, if you had enough film in the fridge and your scanner was okay, then uh, that was it. And this is something that I think especially people that start out, uh, you know, it's something that we don't have in the whole recipe yet, that you, you need a plunger, you need a scope, and you need computing and storage, and a lot of it, probably. So maybe it's also that, that it's just a matter of time until we fully adjust to, um, you know, kind of budgeting this in from the start, because I, I kind of often sense that that's not the case, and it's never enough, and there's something extra every year, and it's very difficult to sell internally. Yeah. Yeah. You're seeing a lot of nods uh, there, there, I think, um, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of people that recognise that. And I, th um, I think this is, and you're exactly right, and this is probably only a problem that is going to get worse with faster detectors, more automation, is only going to become more and more important. Um, so it'd be interesting to see where we are in a year's time on this. 
I, I think that if we can do things um, as a community and specifically for CryoEM, we'll be helping each other um, as well um, because it, it's quite, yeah, it's a bit of a minefield. Um, and obviously the, if you go to um, you know, big organizations, the more that you're asking for, the cheaper the kind of the smaller unit becomes um, as well. So um, it, it's something that might be worth thinking about as a community. I do have one other thing which uh, also links in, I think, um, which is uh, from, from an indus industrial point of view um, and working for um, a CRO is that I get a lot of people that come to me and say, well, how long is it going to take uh, take you to solve this structure or, um, you know, how much, um, what's the cost going to be? And um, part, you know, one of my big worries is always, are we going to hit the uh, preferred orientation problem? Um, because that could be, so I think that I, it's, it's reassuring, although I want it to happen quicker, <laughs> that we can get to a point where um, we have um, a sample prep solution, which um, automatically uh, tries to um, remove that problem. That, that will be, make life a lot easier for me um, in terms of being able to predict um, how easy it's going to be to solve novel structures. There's many, many problems, but, but that is, uh, I would say that is a significant one. Um, so next, I just wanted to invite Ed to, um, to say a few words on, uh, on EM training. I think the main thing that we all talked about was training because we want to move to more remote formats and that dovetails into sustainability and, and trying to have a lighter footprint. But the curious thing is we're all putting content up there. We're all trying to increase uh, remote operations, increase bandwidth. The question is how effective it is and something probably we'll probably have to do in a few months. Maybe we should have sort of a subgroup workshop saying, okay, we generate all this content and we try to train all these people, what was effective, what might not be effective for me might just be because I have a different facility and could be materials you could use. And so there was a talk about, we don't wanna duplicate a lot of effort. Uh, time is a, a luxury we don't have. And do we wanna be on a microscope or do we wanna be teaching? We wanna do both, but we can't have it both ways. Yeah, and I guess that like comes back to again, this information sharing thing and how we can work better as a community. Maybe, um, maybe we need to transfer some of this com this conversation to the Slack group until we find a better home for it or until we adjust that group so it's the appropriate home. Um, but yeah, I think um, the, the, there does seem to be more formal training programs happening as well. So um, the University of Leeds in conjunction with SEMI, Glasgow, um, Leicester and uh, EBIC National Facility at Diamond are shortly going to be launching a five-year training program um, uh, in Crow EM, uh, where we're hoping to um, people on all the way from um, people who've touched a grid before in their life um, through to offering training aimed at more experienced users who are really looking to build their skills or tackle really challenging projects. Um, and uh, uh, I think in terms of that grouping and that grant, um, we'd love to learn from all of the other activities that are happening globally and and you know if we can all save ourselves some time then that would be that, that's really a benefit to all of us following on from that slightly um rather than just thinking about um delivering set and um i guess training in a particular technique um there's also the question of how we can utilize virtual formats and online training courses um, in other things, for example, image processing, um, to bring in uh, expertise where they might not necessarily exist in a particular institution. And I know, Melissa, that's something we've been talking about offline. So just wondered if you could say a few words on that. Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, like Becky said, I, I'm not a computational expert. Um, everyone in our facility kind of has varying levels of that, but none of us really feel that we are experts enough to formally train our users, but that shouldn't keep us um, from providing that for our users. So we're looking at setting up workshops um, specifically for computational stuff, because that's what that's the big need that we have. Um, and kind of something that Mike pointed out earlier was, you know, cloud computing is something that um, can be used to help that if you don't have local resources. Um, we um, are looking to, this can also go towards, you know, sustainability, 
Um, it's going to be cheaper to run some of these workshops if you're not flying people in. It makes more people accessible in their different time zones. Um, so I think it's it's something that we should we should all consider even as as these COVID restrictions and travel restrictions will eventually fade away. Um, we should keep these platforms that we all now are very experienced with to continue to share information. And whether it's a formal workshop or smaller gatherings of you know. 12 facility people around the world to talk about certain things and, and um, share our struggles and, and our common solutions. Um, I, that's something that, that we really hope to, to keep going and make it a very um, common tool in our facility to share expertise. Yeah, I mean, that would be just brilliant if we could, you know, if we are able to take some of these lessons and some of the things we've been forced into doing uh, and actually leverage them to produce something good and better in the future, then. Uh, and that that makes this year seem slightly better <laughs> in the in the grand scheme of things. Um, so I hope that everybody found um, all of the sessions and talks over the last couple of days uh, really useful. Like I say, I, I, I've said, I always find this grouping um, a, a brilliant one in terms of being able to share that expertise and that community experience. And I'm really, really delighted um, to say that EMBL Heidelberg um, and uh, Simo has agree, have agreed to host um, uh, the next meeting. So I'd um, just like to give you the floor and um, just introduce yourself, say a little bit about the Imaging Centre and um, yeah, and uh, so everyone knows your face for next year. Yeah, thank you very much, Peggy. Hello, everyone. I'm Simone Mattei, and since June, I uh, joined uh, EMBL as team leader for the Electron Microscopy Service and Technology Development at the Imaging Center. And just to give you a brief overview of the Imaging Center, it is a new imaging facility built at EMBL Heidelberg, which will host uh, two teams, one specialized in the EM and then one uh, specialized in light microscopy. And the idea is that for the first time to have a EMBL um, uh, facility that is actually uh, devoted to uh, providing service to external users uh, mainly. And um, of course, we, we build, especially for the electron microscopy part, we build upon uh, the great work of Vim and Felix in the GraUM service platform. And we try to expand um, that service with um, the latest technologies. We, we will focus our efforts uh, in the development of fully automated pipelines for high throughput screening, which is clearly a bottleneck uh, nowadays, but also to the more challenging uh, development of uh, cryo cram approaches uh, in collaboration with the, with the other team, uh, uh, the light microscope team. And of course, we will benefit from the close connection with the research units uh, just across the, the road. And uh, at the moment, we are still under construction. The building is not uh, ready yet, should be done by the end of the year. We are building also our teams. We still have one position um, to be filled, uh, an image analysis specialist. So uh, very soon we will post uh, the, the job opening. So feel free to spread this uh, in your network. And um, I think in April, we will start the uh, installation of, of, the, of the new microscopes. And uh, one of the mission of the Imaging Center is not only uh, to provide uh, imaging, uh, imaging services to, to the community, but also um, to promote training and, of course, um, um, you know, workshops and, and um, scientific uh, information. Uh, the, and the spreading of conferences and 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 therefore I think it's great that we uh, um, we can host the next instruct meeting uh, for cryoEM. I I'm not sure if now at the moment what we uh, what format we will have if we can go back to uh, an in-person meeting uh, like it was in the past or we will continue uh, um, with the visual meeting which I think. Anyway, it was a spectacular result. I didn't expect to be uh, that good. And, um, and I thank Becky for that. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think in the next few months, we, we will keep in touch. Uh, we will start reaching out to the speakers of, of the new meeting and start to uh, organizing um, for 2021. That's great, thank you. And I'm really, really keeping everything crossed that I'm gonna be able to come and visit you in person uh, next year. 
Um, fantastic. Well, with that, um, we'll bring the meeting to a close. So once again, thank you so much to all of the speakers, all of the chairs, all of the panelists. Massive thank you to the Instruct team, especially Steph, for all of your hard work in doing the, the organisation on this. Um, hopefully it won't be another year before I see all of your lovely faces, uh, even if it has to be virtually. Um, but that's it. So, um, yeah, thank you very much, everybody, and hope to see you and speak to you again soon.